Josh Moseman, nice. we're, uh, we're doing Gypsy Tales, mate. Just like that. Thanks for having me, man. At the end of the series, it's like, you know, we just beat our head against the wall for 12 rounds. Just brutal. Like, we signed up to go suffer, you know? Yeah, We're yeah. paying money yeah, to go why, suffer. Why did we sign up for Yeah. This? When they first came out with it, it was just right at Yamaha, Kawi Honda. Now it's jumped up to 10400 bucks. It's the same as the new Kawi, which is all new and they yeah. raised the price. I tried to get him to talk about Honda versus KTM, and he admitted that, like, yeah, the Honda wasn't good. You know, there was problems that I had with it, but some of the problems were my fault. He owned his mistakes. I met a gypsy. Now, if you've been following the podcast recently, you would know that we're on a massive health kick uh, as we get ready to take on World Vets at Glen Helen in November of 2023. Athletic Greens is not only an all-in-one formula that helps me just cover all my nutritional bases, uh, it's also the first healthy habit that I have uh, that starts every single day. AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients of the highest quality that are able to offer gut health support, mood support, can affect your energy each day and contribute to overall healthier looking hair and skin. All right, we're on. Josh Moseman, nice. we're, uh, we're doing Gypsy Tales, mate. Just like that. Thanks for having me, man. I am. Uh, I'm extremely stoked that that you're here. Um, we've kind of to set the scene for people. We've kind of known each other for a really long time yep. through a very good mutual friend in Jackson Richardson. Yeah. But we only properly got to meet when I got back to the US this year. But also before that, for like the last five years or however long you've been at MXA, I've just been a genuine fan of you, the MXA content. But I, I honestly think that you've done such a good job for those guys there and you've gotten so much more natural on camera and like you can just really see like you grew into that role. Yeah, it's, there. Kind of, it's documented, huh? Yeah, yeah, and it's just cool because, I mean, you could probably correct me if I'm wrong here, but you seem like the kind of guy that you weren't, frothing to be on camera like you're not an over the top like look at me kind of guy and it, you, it was just like very informative you know like you were kind of just doing your job yeah but it really seems like you've just kind of got more comfortable and now you're just doing your thing and it's honestly a pleasure to watch and i think you do an awesome job so. dude thank you so much i really appreciate it um yeah it's been a it's been a really cool journey with motocross action and we can get into it but uh I'd say I've always liked being on camera and I always liked videos. And even when I was younger, I would make videos of my buddies and I would be the guy behind the camera. Uh, not so much taking photos, but more taking video of my buddies and putting together little YouTube videos. And um, so then when I got this job and even when I was younger, like my mechanic would give me a hard time. My friends would give me a hard time for, you know, hitting the jump three times and no, get, get another picture. No, like yeah, take, take another yeah. picture, you know? And they would mess with me because like, I, don't, I haven't thought about this in a while, but they would mess with me because I was taking pictures and messing around. And then now I get paid to ride dirt bikes and take pictures. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. a little funny, huh? Yeah. But thank you so much for the compliment. Like it's been uh, just over five years at MXA now and it's been a, a wild ride. It's been cool though. Yeah. And the channel's grown a lot. Like I think that um, it's always been a staple when it comes to the, the magazine. And then you guys were very into the youtube stuff early on yeah um but now man I, you got it's one of the biggest channels like yeah. it's i look at all the channels obviously in the landscape and it's pretty insane thank you the kind of numbers that you guys can uh, can consistently put out honestly and that's not just me that's like we have that's the whole crew it's the whole crew yeah yeah, yeah we have a really good crew and I definitely want to, you know, boast in the crew because I get a lot of credit for it because you see my face on the videos. But uh, Trevor Nelson, he's uh, our digital editor. Dude, he kicks butt. Yeah. Like I've known him for a while. Before before he started, I, I knew him just a little bit. But uh, but man, he just kicks butt. He, he knocks it out. And even when he started, he was more into photo 
and designing logos. Yep. And we, you know, said, yeah, you can come shoot some photos. We can't pay you, but you can, you know, we'll use your photos here and there. And that's kind of how every media job starts in the industry. Yeah. It's like, hey, we can't pay you, but maybe someday we could. And uh, and so that's how it worked with Trevor and men. Like, so he has a background in like as an artist, you know, de yep. developing logos, uh, developing digital stuff on the computer, and then photos was his passion. So like with that, he grew and grew and grew. And then now uh, with the other video guy taking a step back, he stepped in and filled up the plate as video guy, photo guy, and designing the covers every month, designing t-shirts, designing wow. ads for the magazine. So Trevor Nelson is like our, what do you call it? A Swiss army knife. Yeah. You know, yeah. he, uh, he does awesome. So, and we just got him to race the 24 hour a couple, couple That's months right. You ago. stitched yeah. him up for that. I, I did. I totally stitched him up. And, uh, and put him up so i made him iron man it i didn't make him but i convinced him to <laughs> yeah. and uh that was pretty awesome so yeah so with him um and with the rest of our crew like daryl Eklund, jody is super involved you know jody's been at motocross action forever so we've had we started in 1973 50 years ago that's crazy yeah doing motor so basically when motocross was like started starting yeah, yeah. yeah. and then uh, jody he was working for cycle news he was working for a couple other people and then 76 like he had offers from everybody to go work there and he's like motocross action is a place i can go and just ride motocross mm. so he's like that's where i'm gonna do so i think it was 76 three years after we started he he started mxa and he's still there and he's still i think he's 77 now still races almost every saturday still rides on saturdays and uh still washes bikes like anytime i go to jody's house where i have five bikes to wash you know he's he he grabs the soap and I'm I'm washing. If I drop the pressure washer to do something else, he grabs the pressure washer, you know. And he's 76 years old and he's been doing it since 1976. That's so cool. Since right? motocross started, you know. So I just like it's it's a cool team and so he's 76 years old but he's doing our website still. Like if I leave for the week, how does stuff get posted, you know? He's posting on the website. If I'm at the track, I mean he's at the track every day with us almost. But, uh, but yeah, Jody kicks butt. I mean, he's up earlier than everybody else, you know, uh, and he, he leads by example. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing, but he's not on camera too much. Yeah. So people don't know what he's up to. People don't, people don't, uh, unless you're reading the magazine, you're not, maybe you don't know exactly what he's doing, but so him, Daryl Eklund, my boss, um, he moved into a new role now. And then, uh, we have a lot of test riders like Dennis Stapleton, who you probably yep. know. Yeah. I mean, Dennis has traveled. You've traveled a lot, right? Yeah, he's traveled a lot. He's traveled a lot, yeah. dude. I could I could talk for hours about just my crew, but Dennis, I'm pretty sure he's raced a motorcycle in more countries than anybody else in the whole world. Like physically racing yeah. a motorcycle, yeah, I, I bet, dude. And then and then riding a motorcycle even more. You know, he's been to some countries he didn't have a race to go, but he was riding one yeah. while he was there. So I think it's over 40 countries that he's raced a dirt bike in. That's insane. Yeah. It's insane that there's 40 countries that race dirt bikes. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, some of them, it's there's only 20 people in the country and two of them ride, but he raced them and probably beat them, you know? <laughs> so. it's, it's funny, hey, the, since COVID and everything kind of opened up, yep. uh, I've just been traveling as much as possible. And man, I've raced bikes in Bali like road in Dubai. That's like sick. I wanted to, I think I'll miss the season, but I wanted to do the Saudi Arabia club days Dude, this year. That'd be awesome. But I think the season's going to be over by the time I'm back. But man, it's crazy how global dirt bikes are and, and bikes. Like uh, there's so many trips that I want to do because yeah. To, and for the most of the world, two wheels is the form of transport. Totally. You totally. Know? Yeah. And Whereas in the Western world, it's so different. But yeah, motorcycles run so deep. So yeah. much deeper than four wheels for most people. Honestly, uh, Indonesia is a big yep. one. You've been there a couple yep. of times, right? Yeah. Yeah, I raced there when I was like 15 or 16. And yeah, everybody's on scooters riding around, as you've talked about before. I mean... They've all got monster stickers. Yeah, and yeah. Like Repsol, uh, the scooters look like Repsol Hondas and stuff. Yeah, and they're huge fans. Like the track that we raced at... There wasn't any track markers. There wasn't any hay bales. There's just people lining the track. No way. Yeah, just people lining the track. And uh, the bike I had was a Suzuki because I was kind of riding for Suzuki at the time. So I needed one. And yeah. it would have been way better off if I had just picked like the newest bike that they had. But I got a pretty worn out Suzuki that broke most of the time. But but it was still like a crazy race. Uh, 
they didn't have a ton of water. Like the waters that we had were like little yogurt cups with, yeah. li- with lids on them that you yeah, peel the yeah. yogurt cup to drink the water. Yeah, like flat, old school flat waters. Dude, gnarly. You know, Jaden Archer, J-O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was there doing oh, doing freestyle. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. He yep. talked about that. Yeah, yeah. So that was cool to meet him before he was- uh, The he triple was, flip dude. He was buff then, but he's probably twice as heavy, twice he's as strong yoked, now. Dude, eh? yeah. He gets up every day to go to the gym at three o'clock. I, I believe it. I yeah. 100% believe it. So I haven't talked to him in many, many years, but- yeah, he was there and that was a cool experience. But long story short, like motorcycles, I've been able to race all over the world as well. But Dennis, he's uh, on he's a on a whole level. nother level. Yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing too, so I was talking to Dennis at Parlor. He introduced himself just one of the days that I was out there riding. Yeah. And man, I don't know how we got on the subject, but he was like, he said something about, oh, Davey Havoc and, you know, his Halloween party, who's the lead singer at AFI. And I was like, dude, AFI is one of my favorite bands. He's yeah. Like, oh, I went to college with him or I went to school or whatever yeah. it was. He's like, I'll go there for Halloween if you want. I was like, wow, like you literally know everyone and have like been everywhere. Dude, D- Dennis is Dennis is one of a kind. And he sends it still, eh? Well, there's two sides, but <laughs> but I only know the the good side of Dennis and the and and they're Dennis is awesome. All I meant on the bike. Sends it on the bike. Okay, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, Dennis is uh Dennis is awesome, man. He's, he does send it on the bike. There's sometimes he's 41, 42. And sometimes I'm like, man, I got to pick it up or uh, I'm going to get past here. You know? Yeah. I've, I watched him ride at Glen Helen. It might, might've been the week before vets. Yeah. And you remember they had the right hander after the finish line mm-hmm. and it was, it always gets so chewed out that yep. inside outside yep. and every lap he was just hitting it wedged and the bike would kick sideways. He just held the thing on the limit. I was sick. like, my man. Yeah. No, Dennis is awesome. He actually, I lived with him for a while when I first came down to oh. Southern California because I grew up in Northern California. So before, was that before your parents and that had the house yep. out here? Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, I stayed there, uh, rented a room, trained with Kelly Andrus, who's a guy from, he's from Northern California who lives in Chile and brings guys from Chile over here to uh, race. Uh, and so he brought me down to Chile and brought me to Argentina to do some races. But, uh, but Kelly connected the dots with Dennis. Dennis is from Santa Cruz. You know, we stayed there, trained there. And then eventually I was like, I can't leave. I got to stay down in SoCal. Then my brother came and, and then now I'm here. And uh, it's kind of funny, like, moving to SoCal to train and ride and race was a big step from Northern California. And I was like, I didn't want to do it. My brother was like, I'm going to be the first pro that makes it out of NorCal and yeah. doesn't go to SoCal because I don't want to leave home, you know? Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, I convinced him shortly after to move to SoCal. And he's like, oh, I don't want to move to Florida, you know? Like, I'll, I definitely don't want to move to Florida. I'm going to stay in SoCal. And then soon later, he's back in Florida, you know, living out there. So, so Is that where he is now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got a house out there. Um, and he kind of goes back and forth whenever he's out riding out here. He's, we, uh, my parents' place that you've been to in Menifee, yep. so he'll stay there whenever he needs to in, in SoCal. But then, uh, but yeah, he has a house in Florida. He loves Florida now. It's just so funny. Like, yeah. you know, he wanted to be the guy to make it out of NorCal and then didn't want to leave SoCal. And here he is now in Florida. And he, uh, his, his wife Amber is from there. So yeah. he loves Claremont. I mean, he's, he knows everybody there now. So, oh, that's awesome. Pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a good dude. So I, I met Mick a bunch of times yeah. before, like, because him and Jats were just hanging out all yeah. the time. Yeah. And yeah, he's always been such a cool, cool was it, dude. Was he trying to play off his Australian accent with you? And it's pretty good. Yeah. Right. Like, he actually does. It's one of the better Australian accents. He's yeah. obviously just spent so much time around Jats. Yeah. Well, Jackson lived with us for years. Yeah. And then his mechanic for a while was Scott Lillis. And yep. Scott's from Australia. Yeah. So those two really, you know, got him going good. And my brother's pretty hardcore. If he wants to learn something, he'll figure it out uh, yeah. and so that was that was the story but yeah good times i'm sure your loyal listeners probably remember jackson from oh everyone knows. he's right? like fan favorite dude. yeah he fan is. favorite he is and my favorite too so it's good <laughs> stuff so let's go back we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through i want to hear a bit about the racing career so you were a racer first and then the whole like most people might know your face from the video stuff but obviously there's a long way to get there so what was your early racing career like and you kind of came through the ranks obviously racing out of norcal then you guys moved here yep. um and you still can you still qualify for national so you're obviously still a racer yeah but that mode and that version of your life i guess 
well, I mean, you can go as long or as little as, as you <laughs> yeah. want with that. But I uh, started at six years old on bikes, XR50. And uh, yeah, my brother was three, I was six. So I always say he got a three year head start on me and now yeah. started younger than me. Um, started out with red rain boots and Fox gear, HJC helmet. Did your dad race or anything like that? He rode. Yeah. So yep. my dad's actually from Southern California. My uh, mom is from Sweden. Uh, and so, uh, she moved over here after high school and she met my dad in Southern California. I was born in Laguna Hill, uh, yeah, Laguna, Laguna Hills, but moved to NorCal at three with my, obviously. And then my brother was born up there, but, um, yeah, so started, up there riding around the house um, and progressed pretty quickly. So my dad rode, he uh, he rode as a kid, but didn't ride a lot. He raced a couple of times, broke his leg, always liked riding, but you know, didn't. And then he busted his butt as a construction yeah. carpenter. So my dad, you know, that was his motocross is just, you know, on the track you want to beat everybody. Uh, as a media guy, you want to, you want to do the, you're your best. You want to beat everybody. And for him, it was in the carpenter world and being a construction he, And guy. he built a really good business, right? Like yeah. he, he's a bit of a G when it comes to yeah. actually running a yeah, business. For yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So he does construction and, and his company's up in Northern California. Yeah. And that was how obviously my brother and I were able to race. But, um, but yeah, so he busted his butt during that. And then by the time I was six, my brother was three. He was like, all right, it's time to get these guys bikes. I, I had to learn how to ride a bike without a training wheel, without training wheels. And then I don't know, maybe that timeline's off. I, f I feel like I was riding a bike before that, but, uh, maybe it was my brother that had to ride it without training wheels or something, but we got bikes. He had a training wheels on his JR 50 for a little bit. And then we, we moved on from there, but, uh, yeah, local riding. My dad raced dirt modifieds, uh, cars. Yeah. Okay. So kind of like sprint cars, but yep. down yep. a couple notches, much bigger, much slower. Um, but you know, racing the same style of tracks as sprint cars. And so he did dirt modifieds. We would go, uh, we would race sack raceway Friday night with Jared Stanky. He was obviously years older than us and yeah. way faster than us, but at the same track, uh, Friday night, Sacramento. And then Saturday, my dad would race in Petaluma, dirt modifieds. And then Sunday we would be, uh, maybe after church, go ride at, at my parents' house or my dad's shop. Yeah. And that was kind of the program for all of our, our buddies growing up. But yeah, that's how it started. And then, uh, yeah, grew up racing in Northern California and pretty soon we were going to all the amateur nationals and, uh, heavy into it. I mean, I don't know what, what you want to know, but, but, uh, what, what year was your first Loretta's? So my brother qualified in the four to six fifty class. Well, yeah. So he just went, like yeah. he was one of the, one of those kids. Yeah. My brother qualified four to six fifty class. I think that was 2006. Yeah. 2000, 2005 or six. And then I qualified the next year in the 85, seven to 11 class. He was in the older 50 group that time. Yeah. And, uh, from there, what was it? Let's say it was uh, maybe 2005, somewhere in there. All the way up until I turned pro, we were at Loretta's every year. And same thing for him up until he turned pro, Loretta's every year. Um, yeah, I mean, training with the master pools, that was a big part of oh, our- Oh, sick. Yeah, that was a big part of our growing up was like the first, Jerry was kind of our first real trainer. Yeah. Um, we had little trainers here and there, but Jerry and the master pool family, they came and lived uh, at my parents' shop in Sebastopol up in Northern California. And it was the coolest thing. So I was in fifth grade, Jesse Masterpool yep. was in fifth grade, but he was homeschooled. And so Jesse, uh, Jake and Ty, they were all homeschooled. They'd never been to school. So um, I'm getting off into the weeds, but long story short, like I took Jesse to fifth grade with me for a day. My, no my, my brother took Jake to second grade for him for, for a day. Um, and Ty was, t you know, still too young and maybe kindergarten or, or younger, but he, Ty was ripping on a PW 50 and he was scrubbing on it at my, at our track. So long story short, they lived at our, at our place for maybe close to a year. And every day after school, we would have a new track built because Jerry never leaves the track the same, even at their facility now. Really? And, yeah. Even at their facility now in Texas, I haven't been there in a few years, but I'm pretty sure his policy hasn't changed to where it's different every single day. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we had 
epic dirt there in Sonoma County. I mean, perfect loam. I mean, just imagine the best dirt possible. That's what we had. Like a little more like black sort of loamy. Little dirt. black loamy. Yeah. You could build jumps with it. If you didn't water it, it would get hard packed after a while. But yeah, yeah. If, as long as you watered and ripped it, it was perfect, you know. The only thing it was maybe not clay enough to hold like super, super solid ruts. Yeah. But it was more loamy, yeah, fun yeah, like yeah. that. And uh so yeah, that was just an epic track right outside of the shop. Um but that was when Jesse was on 85s and I was on 85s. Jake and my brother were on 65s. Ty was on a PW50. And we were That's all, a sick crew. Yeah, it was super fun. And we had Ben LeMay there. He was wearing his uh, Scott boots, those big plastic boots yeah, for a little yeah, bit when they yeah, tried to make yeah. a comeback, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a little bit of our story at growing up. And What uh, bikes did you ride back then? I was Suzuki 85. My brother... Were you on the Suzuki program? Not on 85s. My brother was when he was on 85s. Um, and so, yeah, my brother got up to Suzuki 85s. Then by the time I was on 125s, I had a little bit of support from Suzuki, um, from the Rockstar Suzuki team, but it was, wasn't a lot. It was mostly my brother had support and I kind of got some stuff on the side and yeah, that yeah, was it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, and was your goal just you were pro? Like, that that was the direction you were heading. So, did you go all the way through uh, high school, like, actually going to school as well? No. So, uh, middle of sixth grade, I left for the Spring Nationals for two weeks and, you know, asked, told my teachers all about it, said I need all this work to be gone for two weeks racing at, uh, it was... I can't even remember the track. Oak Hill was the second race, but the first round before it was a really sick track in Texas. He, you might remember it. Um, the, Lake Whitney. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lake Whitney, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lake Whitney was sick. So, yeah, those two tracks. And uh, came back and the teachers were like, you're going to get kicked out of school, you know, this and that. So you got to go to independent study. So I did that. Yeah. Um, and then my brother starting in sixth grade did the same thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, but you were just pro. You were like, all right, that's the dream. Me and my brother, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And then what happened when you went pro? Like, did you, how long did you race pro for? And Yeah. So a little bit of that story also was like, because my dad, like you said, had a, had a successful construction company and he worked his butt off you know, we could afford bikes and my dad could afford a motorhome to take us to the races and he could afford to, to send us to a cool races. And, uh, but then we had a lot of pros asking my dad for money yeah. to go to races, you know, and like friends sometimes. And, uh, it was kind of right in sixth grade is when I was kind of framing my opinion on motocross and what I wanted to do is like, I want to be a pro and I want to make it, but I also don't want to be a guy that has to ask my friend's dad for money kind, yeah, of, kind of thing yeah, to get yeah. to the races. So yeah. I think that was a pretty big part of like my whole story as a racer was that I always knew I don't want to be struggling to go to the races and like, you know, you're either going to make it or you're not. And uh, so that was my outlook on it. It's so good that you had that perspective early on because man, so many people, they just end up like, almost ruining their lives because they're just hanging on to it for so long and it's just like and it's cool it's cool to do that but it's not cool to kind of forsake everything else for it you know like if you've got something else going on or you're sort of working in the industry or you're kind of like if there's a plan b because yep. there's a certain point where it's like you've got to have all right, plan a i've got no plan b i'm focused but it's like that can only go to a certain point right and yep. then it's like okay now I, i'm not going to be jet lawrence or ricky carmichael i need to kind of figure out what else i can be so it's yep. good you kind of had that perspective <laughs> thank you yeah it, it, everybody's story is different too like somebody ha some p people have for sure support behind them a good foundation behind them and it's like they have a backup plan when they stop racing so it's hard to judge from the outside in like that guy shouldn't be on the track or he should you know or this guy quit too early or he didn't so it's definitely everybody's got a different point, but uh, but yeah, for me, I was I knew that I, you know, didn't want to be the guy struggling to make it, and I also didn't want to, you know, ride my ride on my dad for as long as he could pay for it. Like I wanted to grow up and be a man and pay for pay for it myself, you know. Yeah. So so yeah, that was a little bit of the story, um, but it's definitely yeah, it's definitely wild. So 
I guess, where, where were you going from there? Oh, so when you did go pro, so you just privateered it for the like the first little bit? Yeah. And what was your first season pro? 2016. So so this is a kind of a funny story too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's lots of funny stories I got for you. But, but yeah, so I raced, you know, as an amateur training with Nathan Ramsey. Oh, awesome. Uh, you know Nathan yeah, well yeah, from really the JDR well. team, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Nathan was like, he's awesome. He's and, the best. Yeah. And so uh, training with him and getting ready to race in A class. And I did Loretta's <clears throat> in 2015 and I got like top tens in the A class, but it wasn't very good. It was like, okay, you know, chances of getting a ride or anything aren't looking great. Yeah. And I was, I've always, I was sponsored by Fox um, and I always loved Fox, obviously. They're an awesome company and Todd Hicks and Aaron West took such good care of us and made us feel so cool. And uh, so at Surfer Cross, right after Loretta's, I was just there hanging out watching my buddy Justin Lee and a couple other guys. And uh, I told Todd, and I've always respected Todd so much, and I said, hey, you know, Loretta's didn't go so well, so I might be asking you for a job here soon. And it was a joke, but it was, it was just just messing with them you know yeah and a couple months later i was getting ready for monster cup to race the supercross it wasn't supercross futures it's all stars at monster yeah cup. i remember that yeah so i was riding supercross uh but before like i was getting ready for that and then todd called and he's like hey uh, we need somebody to work at fox we need like an assistant to our team ma uh, manager for the pro guys making butt patches jerseys you know help out be a part of the family come work for us, you know? So I was like, hey, I don't want to push you out of your racing. But, but if this you, is here if you But if it. you were serious, we think you'd be the great, a great guy for the job. And I was like, all right, I'm a Christian. You know, I, I believe that God's got a plan for me. So maybe this is what, maybe this is God's sign of like, hey, here's a really cool job. Maybe you should stop racing and take the job. So I had raced A class. I was like, I'll do Monster Cup. And then, uh, and then I'll take the job after that. And then I broke my foot. Uh, Scott Lillis, it was actually his first day working for us. And he was in between taking a job for Pro Circuit or taking a job working for my brother as like uh, an amateur guy yeah, yeah. for the Rockstar Husky team. Yeah, Because my brother wasn't pro yet. It was like he was still amateur, but riding with Rockstar Husky. And, yep. uh, and so Scott came with me to the track, first time hung, hanging out really, and uh, break my foot. So he's driving me to the hospital. I'm laying in the back of the van, you know. It's like great first time meeting each other, you know. Uh, yeah. I think he even went to go interview with Mitch after that, like oh. that day or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he ended up staying with us, and that was super cool. But yeah, first day with Scott, you know, break my foot, and then all right, well, I'm done racing now. I'm gonna go take this job. So that goes into another story, you know, of uh, me and Scott riding our bicycles from my parents' house in Northern California, in Sebastopol, hour north of San Francisco. 650 miles down the coast uh, to my parents' house in Menifee. No way. Yeah. You did that on bicycles? Bicycles. No it, way. It was like the best, second best week of my whole life. Really? Yeah. My best week was getting married and going on honeymoon in Bora Bora. But, yeah, uh, yeah. But that was the second best week probably of my whole life. Just wow. Like, yeah, it was really cool. So it took a week to get there. Yeah. So I could, you know, we could talk for a long, a little yeah, as just, you want. Yeah, just go. Just go. So, uh, so yeah, I broke my foot. Scott's working for my brother now and Scott's cycling. I have a buddy who cycles too and I always thought it'd be cool to, to ride down the coast and I thought I shouldn't do it because it's not good for motocross. Like as as a motocross, like training for motocross, I need to do more gym stuff because I'm naturally a good guy on a bicycle but a bad guy in the gym. Yeah. I needed more strength. Work on your weaknesses kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like it would never make sense for me to do a week long of bicycling for motocross. But for the first time I didn't have motocross because I was going to go take this job. So uh <clears throat> so I I uh yeah I convinced my buddy to do it with me, but then he dropped out pretty quickly. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to go. So then I was telling Scott about it and Scott's like, yeah, I'll go with you. I was like, we, we just met. We had never even ridden bicycles together. I still had a broken foot. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. And so that was a great way to get to know him. And we uh, drove my parents' van up to NorCal for Thanksgiving. And then we had our bicycles in there. And then it was, I was, 17, 18, and my parents were like, hey, 
you're kind of crazy, you know? What are you thinking here? And I was just going to take a backpack and a tent. We, we had not very well, it wasn't super well planned out, but we were just going to do it. And we had no timeline. Like Scott didn't have anything he needed to do because he was working for my brother. My brother wasn't doing anything really at that time. I don't know if he was injured or, or it was just off season, you know? So he had no nothing, no time constraints. Yeah, so you're just like, oh, we'll just do it as long as it takes. I had three weeks until I started the job. So I was like, and it's not going to take three weeks. We can do it faster than that. So we drive up to NorCal and then my parents are like, hey, how about we just uh, pay for your buddy to, to follow you in the van? So my buddy, Mark Hansen, he's working for my dad's construction company as a truck driver, driving wood around. And, and he's like, hey, we'll just pay him his normal salary to follow you guys in the van down the coast. So then it turned into a full factory deal <laughs> because, you know, we went from backpacks to not having to carry any extra weight with us. So we rode past San Diego or sorry, past San Francisco to uh, Monterey Bay the first yeah, night yeah. and a hundred miles. <coughs> and uh, my buddy Mark met us at the Golden Gate Bridge. He met us like one other time and we had, you know, lunch with him, another snack with him. And then he met us at the hotel and we booked, like, I'm on the phone with my mom as we're cycling. Like, Hey mom, wait, I think we're we going to end up about here. Yeah. I think we can make it to Monterey. You want to book us a hotel over there? So she booked us a hotel next day. Same thing. We went down to, oh, I can't even remember the city off the top of my head, but, uh, yeah, we went to the, to the next city, a hundred miles again and down the coast. And, uh, same thing, stop for lunch, stop for a snack. And then mom, I think we're going to make it to this town. Can you book us a hotel? And so my mom really took care of us yeah. as she, as she always does. Uh, my, you know, the parents van was awesome. We bought extra tires, extra tubes. None of us got a flat the whole, wow. the whole trip. So we did 650 miles, seven days, hundred miles a day plus one fifty mile day. And the best day of it, was Big Sur, so riding through there. Oh, man. Have, have you been through there? I've I've driven through there once, like years and years ago, but it was quick. Yeah, I want to go and do it. Probably, I want to actually take my wife for a drive. You should. There. You really should. It's beautiful, eh? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I should look up the city, but we started just just above Big Sur, and then made it down to Cambria, which is right after yep. Big Sur, and uh, down Highway One the whole way, and it was just the most beautiful day. And like, it's amazing. Yeah. Eh? And the we hit like eight thousand feet of climbing that day and hundred and four miles or something. That's pretty gnarly. It was really gnarly. After and it was our third day in a row of doing a hundred miles, you know. But a beautiful ride. Scott and I were just, you know, kind of going crazy, but also having the best time of our life. Yeah. All you worry about is like, well, we're gonna eat, and where we're gonna sleep, you know? And uh so it was pretty cool. And Scott and I we had a blast. We do these rides where we leave from Cairns, which is the town that we grew up, yep. like where Jats is from. Yep. And then it's 1,800 k's up to the tip of Australia and then and then 18, or maybe it's 1,200, but it's with you. Yeah. So it's about 1,200 up, 1,200 back. Nice. And you're just on a dirt bike for two weeks with just the boys. Nice. And then like my wife drove my, my truck with Sick. all of our sleeping. Sick. We had like maybe six cars and 17 bikes. Nice. We all just go up and same deal. You just got nothing to worry about. Yep. You just got to eat, roll out your swag, talk shit about your ride that you had throughout the day yep. and then do it again the next day. You yep. Just do it for, for two weeks and it's like just removed everything. All the stresses of daily life and, yep. everything, and it is so much fun. Dude, yeah. It's honestly amazing. I always think about like I need to do it again, but now you have a job and I have a wife. I don't want to leave her for the week. And I thought <laughs> yeah. about like tandeming it and putting her on the back and she she likes she, i call her sporty you know she's she's good on the bicycle too so yeah i would definitely want to do something like that again but for mark my buddy mark hansen it wasn't as fun of a trip for him uh, oh it would have been following boring. us in the van. yeah like he he would just drive a couple hours and then then or drive a couple you know 30 miles 40 miles and then wait for us to ride by and then and do, kept doing that. And then Big Sur was the best day for us because it's just such a beautiful place, but he had no cell service that day. So uh -huh. <laughs> so he's like watching movies in the back of my parents' van, but I don't even, I don't think we had much in there for him to watch, maybe some bar to bar or something. So That's so funny. So that's, yeah, that was a pretty epic story. That's such a good way to become mates with the person. Too. Yeah, yeah. Dude, me and I'm, I was thinking about it. Scott and I, we barely rode together. So like, how would we, 
how would we know, like, if we're compatible, am I going to have to wait for him or is he going to have to wait for me? You know, but we ended up being perfect. Like the first day I was strong and he was like, oh man, I'm tired. This is going to be a long week. And then the second day I was tired and he was like, man, I feel pretty good today. You know? <laughs> so like we just, every other day, it was like one guy was suffering, the other guy wasn't. And yeah, it was, it was a cool experience. Dude, that would have been a really cool experience. Riding on the, on the freeway, uh, bicycles on the freeway, because highway one goes all the way down the coast, but it also turns into the freeway a few times. Yeah. Does it turn into the five, is it? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It turns in, no, 101. 101. 101. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and there's a couple of spots where you're allowed to ride bicycles on the freeway because, because they know that people do that route for, for their cycling and stuff like that. So that was fun. And then some, we did some freeway riding where you weren't allowed to ride on it, but, uh, but it was like, we either zigzag through this town for like 30 miles or we do like 10 miles straight really fast down this hill. <laughs> yeah. and we, we pinned it and we almost made it. And the cop's like, hey, you can't ride here. And so we're like, okay, where can we ride? He's like, get off the freeway, go another mile, and then you can get back on the freeway. And so that was our fast day. I think we were like, the Strava numbers were pretty insane. We were like 18 mile an hour average on day five of a, day four of a trip going for a hundred miles. It was but we had the adrenaline of riding on the freeway to yeah, keep so us going faster. Going yeah. Have you ever heard of a dude called the Vegan Cyclist? I have. I don't know much about him, but I have seen him. Yeah, he he did the podcast well, over a year ago now. Cool. But uh, yeah, he does all these crazy adventures yep. on these bikes, and he'll ride for 24 hours straight. He'll ride through all these like Death Valley. And yep. now with the gravel tires, those bikes have become different yeah you know you can really do a lot on them yeah yeah no they're next level yeah so that was that was the story of that cycle trip and uh yeah so it was it was a ton of fun but that was kind of my story also of turning pro so i get the job at fox i worked there for three months and then i realize hangtown's coming up glen helen's coming up and i'm getting all these butt patches ready for cincerillo and forkner and all the guys that ride for pc because that was the year that pc switched yep. to fox yep and I'm like, everybody's in the, and everybody in the office is like, man, you're so fast and you're working at the office now. What's the deal? You know, and all my friends, quite a few of my friends are like, that's cool. You work at Fox and you, you know, you got like a not minimum wage, but you know, you got a starter job, but yeah, why aren't you racing? You know, like my dad was still supporting me fully. It was my, dis my choice. And I thought that that's what I should do. Yeah. So I get that job and then I realized like, Hey, I have all my points from racing, all the A class the last year to get my Nash, uh, my pro license. Yeah. So maybe I should just get my license and do like hang, uh, hang town and Glen Helen or just one of the rounds just for fun, you know, and, uh, and then keep my job at Fox. And then the guys, I told my dad and he was like, dude, let's do it. And I told the guys at Fox and they're like, Hey, you can always come back to this job if you want. Like we really appreciate you. And they were super, super kind. So, they were like, hey, if you want to race, go race. Like, don't let us hold you back, you know? And uh, so I did. <laughs> I decided, okay, I'm done working. <laughs> I went back to training with Ramsey, back to training with Eddie Casillas in the gym. Do you know him at yeah, all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you remember That's Eddie? That's where we probably, I think we first met there. Yep. Did at, we? At Eddie's gym, yeah. Yeah, I think we met like years and years and years ago. Yep. And I, you were training with Jats. Yeah. And then I think he was doing some work on on me. Yeah. And you guys, yeah. So that, I'm pretty sure that's where we first met. Actually. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember I saw you in there and um, yeah, we met just briefly there. So yeah. so yeah, training with Eddie. So like, it was just super funny how I take a three month hiatus. I ride down the coast, then I get this job and then I'm driving from Menifee to Irvine. And I was like, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's go back to racing. So we did outdoors and Jackson and I did it together in 2016. Yeah. And that was, I mean, we could write a book on that. It was, <laughs> it was just next level. So back to training, my brother was riding for Husky. So I went from KTM, uh, because he was riding orange brigade KTM and then he got the Husky ride. So then he was riding Huskies and, uh, and so my dad bought me Huskies and yeah, did all the nationals in 2016. Did you do 250 or 450? 250. Yeah. Yep. And how'd you go? Like, how was it? It was brutal. It, it was like <laughs> every round was like life questioning, life's decisions. Really? Oh, yeah. Jackson and I both were just going through the ringer because Jackson's an awesome rider. Like he's good. He's really good. Yeah. And he was, do you remember his best finish in Supercross? Like fifth maybe in a 250 yeah. main? Well, yeah. I, he, there was one year 
like it was gonna be his year yeah and he got fourth in the first heat race i'm pretty sure at anaheim one Sick. went straight into the main and then i think he got hurt in the main mm. and i think that that was pretty much like it kind of went down from there but, but he, he had, had this, he, ha- the, he had a couple top tens too oh days. heaps of top tens yeah yeah like i think the year before that he yeah. was like seventh eighth six yeah. like he actually i, I thought he was probably gonna be some people were gonna start looking at him yeah. at him for a ride and he was using chat at xpr yeah and, and he was getting starts remember he was yeah. getting all those all those starts yeah and he that was before i knew of chad you know now chad's a pretty popular guy doing yeah. motor concepts engines and lots of other engines that's would have been one of the first dudes using for chad chad yeah i think yeah he lived with chad for a little bit yep. and then my mom, so she's from Sweden. She can speak a bunch of different languages and she could pretty much understand any language. and get Except it. Australian. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so she met, somehow met Jackson's parents and we ran into Jackson at Paula one day and, and then it was like, Jackson was super shy. And, uh, Which is crazy now. Like. Yeah, yeah. And my mom, you know, offered for him to come live at our house and stay in, stay in a room. And I'm like, think my brother and I look at each other like, well, one, he's super shy. Like we don't even, we barely even talked to him before. Like we said something and he was super shy. And then uh, two is like, he's pretty fast. Like <laughs> yeah. he wants to live with us. That, that's cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, how good was he at whoops back then? He was gnarly. He was really gnarly. So gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the, the beginning of Jackson coming to live with us. And he was in his shell pretty, shy but then quickly we opened him up like my brother and i always had friends over eric yorba was training with us yeah, that's right. yeah. Yep. so you know and eric's a talker we're all you know fun loving guys so we had a blast training and, together and, and jets is not shy at all no but just just complete strangers at least back then back then i feel like now he's just fully no, no. yeah changed I, completely because i didn't know him before that so i just yeah. knew him as shy and then he when he left our house he was not shy you know yeah. and so I, <laughs> yeah. I took credit or we, yeah. we took credit for like bringing him out of his shell and then he just kept going on the rev limiter you know but yeah. uh but yeah when he came to live with us we had ping pong table basketball in the backyard and and uh so we just had a blast all the time and and yeah so long story short that was that was pretty fun um but what how he struggled that year what was the year that my dad came over with him was it earlier than that before 2016 14 yeah. or 15 maybe? probably because yeah. he came to live with us uh you know 20 end of 2015 2016 yeah yep. and we did outdoors in 2016 i don't remember how he did in supercross that year but he was struggling i was struggling and he was struggling and going a lot faster than me but uh but we every round i mean we'd be sitting in a little blow up ice bath uh together you know questioning our our decisions and, yeah. uh, and you know wondering if we should even keep going to the next round at every every round basically well it's so gnarly the way that you guys had to drive yourselves there and the mechanic work and the flat tires on the highway and the trailer it's just one thing after another Dude. and then you're just getting your ass kicked on the weekends yeah and like I remember how dejected he was. Oh yeah, back there. he's like, bro, this is no joke. No, no, dude. I mean, like I said, we could really write a book. Like I'll try to summarize it. Uh, you know, I decided to race last minute. We do Hangtown, we do Glen Helen, um, and then we do Thunder Valley. And my dad had we had a Sprinter van, and my brother was racing amateur, and he was you know needed the Sprinter van to go to the practice tracks and stuff, and. Uh, we had a motorhome, and so my dad bought this motorhome with a garage in the back for us to go race the nationals in, and it was really sick. But we bought it, so we raced first three rounds, went to Thunder Valley in a van. Scott Lillis was my mechanic at the first two rounds, 2016, Hangtown, Glen Helen. Um, and, uh, and then we b- bought the motorhome, uh, my mechanic Avery came and he was going to do the nationals with me because Scott couldn't travel the whole way. He needed to stay with my brother. So Avo, he trained at, uh, Scott Atkins motocross, supercross school. Yeah. And base, have you heard of that school? Uh, wait, where is that at? It's in West Virginia, right next to racer X. Ah, uh, yep, yep, yep. It's like a factory. It's like MMI, but for f- supercross and motocross. Yep, yep, yep. Those guys, Scott does an awesome job training guys and, getting them to be full factory mechanics like right away. Yeah. So uh, 
so Avery, you know, grew up riding, did a handful of races in the middle of Wyoming, in the middle of nowhere, you know, and he was big into hockey growing up, but he didn't know a lot about motocross. He, he liked it and his buddy was going to go to the school. So he's like, oh, shoot, I'll, I'll go to the school, whatever, you know? Yeah. So he goes to the school for a year. He turns out to be the best, like one of the best guys. Uh, we're looking for a mechanic. I had a mechanic for a little while getting ready to race these, these, the nationals. And I had to let him go. I was like, dude, you're stressed out about this little stuff, but we're about to drive across. Yeah, this is about to get way gnarly. Way gnarlier than yeah. what we're dealing with in Menifee. Like we're going to drive all 12 rounds in the van. So I let him go. We needed a new mechanic. Avery flew in right after Glenn Helen. Scott taught him a couple things. We went to Thunder Valley. I lose, I, I blew up my engine in the first moto and he has to do a full engine swap oh. for moto two. And uh, that's his, you know, warm up, getting to know me and stuff. Yeah, welcome to the team. So then we go home. We pick, I dr me and Avery drive to Bakersfield from Menifee. We pick up a, a motorhome on our weekend off. Like the first, you do three <laughs> rounds, you get one weekend <laughs> yeah. off. Pick up the motorhome, drive it back to our house, pack it for a week, and then, or pack it for a couple of days, leave on like Wednesday to drive all the way to Pennsylvania to High Point, which I didn't even realize how far Pennsylvania was at the time. You know, I'm just like, oh, High Point, where's it at? The okay, exact Pennsylvania. opposite. I'm like, geez, all the way across, you know? And then I made the decision, like we could drive the flatlands uh, through the bottom of the country, or we could go, you know, back through Thunder Valley and back to the, the, the mountains. And it's like, that'd be way cooler of a drive, you know? And so we took my van, Sprinter van, the motorhome, and I had two buddies helping us. So me and Avo were driving. And then my buddy, Mark Hansen, who helped me drive yeah. down the coast. Yeah. And then my buddy, Tyler Simcox was along for the ride to help us set up, tear down and like cross the country, you know? So we get through the mountains. Motorhome's doing great. The motorhome's fresh. We bought it fresh. I mean, this guy just took it to Sturgis and back. So it's a fresh renegade garage in the back gnarly lift gate the lift gate was gnarly like it's one of the real deal ones that yeah like you can't just let anybody operate it or else they could jack stuff up real quickly like you got to line it up perfectly and with the buttons to make sure it's on there right you know so we get it i learned how to use it the guy left the thing in his garage for years and just took it to sturgis and that was it so it's just sat in the garage on the concrete so the tires were fresh looking, but they weren't fresh because they had been on there for a long time. Yeah. And we make it through the mountains. Luckily, we're in the middle of Missouri, in the middle of nowhere. My buddy, Mark Hansen, who's the most qualified guy to drive it because he's got the license. He's got uh, a lot of truck experience driving for my dad. And he's just, a, he's just a good guy, operator of equipment. So he's driving. My buddy, Tyler Simcox. No, Avery. Avery's in the passenger seat. Going straight in the middle of Missouri, where Forkner's from, right? and straight line luckily steer wheel right steel wheel blows out front right and completely blows out the whole hood of the motorhome oh. is flipped up to where you can't see the road anymore luckily it's straight yeah. and luckily you're not going down a hill and then my buddy's trying to hold it with going 75 or something with a massive rig full of stuff and uh blows up the hood blows up the side dents the frame there's like you could see from avery's passenger seat to the floor you can no see you can see the the asphalt yeah and uh so they're all freaked out they called me and my buddy tyler who are ahead of them just a couple miles in the van we loop around can't believe it so now we got this fresh rig all of our race bikes we got jackson's practice bike in there and jackson and his mechanic chongo we call them yeah. uh they're already you know almost a high point ahead of us but he's had a small van you know hitch rack so we took some of his stuff for him and yeah. So we, we have to leave our brand new motor home. It gets towed to this junkyard. Basically it's like, just, it's not brand new, but it's fresh looking like white, sick, just yeah. blown away that I could even, you know, we could even pit out of something like this. Yeah. And now it's totaled the frames dent and we have to leave it in this junkyard. And, <laughs> uh, so we get our race bike out, we get gear out, we hop in the van and go to high point. Dude, High Point was gnarly. I mean, just a gnarly, gnarly track. Deep ruts, you know, yeah. everything. So suffered through High Point, questioning life's decisions, you know. And then Jackson needed his practice bike. And it's, <laughs> I remember all of this. You remember this? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, in yeah, Missouri. Yeah. Practice bikes in Missouri. Uh, Avery 
He blew up something, didn't he? I think he did. He, yeah, he probably blew, blew up, up an I engine. I think he blew up his race bike. Yeah, and needed the practice And then bike. had to drive all the way back. Dude, there. it's next level, dude. It's next level. So we're in High Point. Um, yeah, then Jackson, I hop in the van with Jackson and Chongo and drive 16 hours or something back to Missouri on Sunday after the race because I can't tell them how to operate the lift gate because they're going to break it, <laughs> you know? The There's lift. no way they can do it. And that's the only reason why me, a racer, in the middle of my rookie season has to drive 16 hours to Sunday after the race and I'm packed in the back of their van, you know? It was just two guys living, you know, van van life. So then it was three guys, van life, back to Missouri. We spend the day there unloading the rig, unloading the van. We, <laughs> we buy a hitch rack. Uh, we had a hitch rack. We bought a, you know, rack for the top of the van to put more stuff up there. We get his bike out. Um, I go for like a road bike ride and yeah, it was like super hot in the middle of Missouri for the day. So then we load back up, we drive from there to Daxton Bennick's house in, is he in South Carolina? Either that or North Carolina, one of the two. Yeah. Somewhere over there. And then, uh, we go to Daxton Bennick's house. We ride there for a couple of days. Like Jackson, and I just drove 16 hours, raced on Saturday, drove 16 hours, unload the rig, you know, and then in the, in the junkyard. And then we drive whatever, 16 hours again to Jack Daxon Bennick's house because we think we need to ride before Muddy Creek that weekend. <laughs> so we ride really six tracks. And because it's so much fun, it's like... It's you like, just smoked yourself. Well, let's ride a little bit more because yeah. it's pretty sick, you know. And so then we just smoke ourselves there. We go to Muddy Creek. We're like, you know, yeah. So then we uh, then we go back to Daxon's house for another couple of days before going to the next round. And then we spend a lot of time in Michigan staying at uh, Craig Bigelow's house. And that was a lot of fun. And we had a ton of fun up there riding Baja acres and uh, going barefoot water skiing in between some rounds. And it was a good location, actually. Michigan was to hit Redbud and not too, too, yeah. you know, Southwick. And yeah. so that was a lot of fun. But yeah, Jackson, I mean, we both had a gnarly year. My best finish was 21st at Washougal. And it's a funny story because I had my race bike all year long. Um, you know, tried my butt off and then we're driving to every single round, riding in between, sleeping, you know, hotels, sleep kind of in the van, this and that. And then I, you know, you had a week off or something and then you had Washougal. And so I flew home, picked up a practice bike and then drove up to Washougal instead of driving our race bikes over there from, um, I think we left our motorhome maybe in Michigan or something. Mm. And so, yeah, we drove the van up to Washougal and I actually did my best there on my practice bike after being home for a week. Cause just, you get home, you have, yeah, you can like relax and it's just like a bit of pressures off. Exactly. Like getting co food cooked for you and stuff. Yeah. Just more relaxing. So, uh, yeah. So that was kind of funny how like you, you spend the whole year on your race bike and then you do your yeah. best on your practice bike after just being home for a couple of days. And so that was 2016. So then how many years did you race pro before you decided that you wanted to pursue something else? So, Yes, yeah, so I did. I did outdoors that year, 2016. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the series, it's like, you know, we just beat our head against the wall for 12 rounds. Just brutal. Like, why did we signed up to go suffer, you know? Yeah. We're yeah. paying money yeah, to go why, suffer. Why did we sign up? <laughs> yeah. <for this>? yeah. <laughs> but it was awesome experience riding amazing tracks, like tracks I'll never forget, like Unadilla, the, how rutted it was in 2016. And, oh, and just crazy experience to, yeah. again, build into like what you did later in, in yeah. your career, you know? For sure. For sure. Like suffering, but life life changing. And then, uh, so end of 2016, I'm like, for a couple of weeks, I'm like, should I keep racing or go get a job or what? And then, you know, a week or two off, you're like, oh yeah, I should keep racing. You know, what else am I going to do? And my dad was still supporting me. He's all in. So it was awesome. My mom, mom too. And so we, uh, then I'm just going to ride supercross or going to do arena cross, get points, ride supercross. And then broke my shoulder. I had to have, yeah, hurt my shoulder. Is that the bad one? That's still kind of bad. It's not the bad one. Yeah. The other one. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Dislocated this one, had to have surgery on it and then was out for supercross. It's like, okay, well get ready for outdoors again. So then, and then I did 450 class 2017 and that was a much better year. Um, flew to most of the races, came home and trained with Ramsey and Eddie during the week. And, uh, that was just a much better experience not having to drive every round. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Less fun and crazy stories, but much more productive results-wise. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so that year I scored 50 points. Yeah, um, oh, that's sick. Yeah, earned national number 71 for 2018. Yeah. And uh, my best result was 15th overall. Had a couple 15th in some motos and uh, ran 10th a couple times for a while. And That's like, rad. Yeah, like the coolest story about a good finish or a good like r- r- running 10th was uh, Unadilla 2017. Um, I had heard the story about Trey Kennard running two goggles in Japan. Have you seen that? No. Nah. So it's a cool story. I've written about this in Motocross Action Magazine many times. So, or not many times, but a couple times, like yeah. giving tips and tricks on mud races, right? So it was poured down rain 2017, and they actually shortened the moto because of the lightning and like I remember. end of the day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so just completely ruined. And I had two goggles for sight lap and for moto. One had like 14 tear outs, one had 21. Scott. Scott goggles was, I believe, the first one to come out with the perimeter sealing tear offs. Where have you seen those? Where they the tear offs stick to your to your lens. Oh, oh, dude, I feel like I'm letting you in on some real moto knowledge really? right here, okay. dude. This is yeah, night life changing stuff. Really? Yeah, people can buy them now. Um, Scott sells them. X brand sells them, and a couple of the other brands sell them as well. But uh, I use X brand a lot and Scott a lot now. But the perimeter sealing, it's basically it's a stack of seven tear offs with a a gasket basically around the outside like a sticker. So you peel, you put the first post down, you peel the sticker, and then you glue it to your lens. So now no water, no dust, wow. no dirt can get behind your tear-offs. Next level. And I had it in 2017. My brother was riding for Rockstar, and they had sponsors paying good money, but you know he had to wear what they gave him, and yeah. s- sometimes that wasn't maybe the best product. So he had dragon goggles. I'm pretty sure. Oh, uh, that went good. No, no. So, <laughs> so you know, so uh, so he had dragon goggles. I didn't even want to tell him that I had these tear offs because I'm running 20th and he's running top 10 or whatever. Yeah, his rookie year, and he's getting dirt behind his tear offs, and I'm cherry. So, long story short, they're like twice as expensive. You can buy them now, but they're expensive. So you, you glue them to your goggles. You get no dirt, no dust, no water. You can do three stacks, glue each stack to each other. So it works, pulls just like a normal tear off, but you're just not getting stuff behind it anymore. And it's better for longevity too, because you could set up tear offs one yeah, day. Yeah, just leave them. And leave them like you're not going to get dust if you throw them in your gear bag or whatever. I do the old like pull the laminate off. Oh yeah, yeah. Sides. Yeah, yeah. Make yeah. the most of it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so that was next level. Long story short, I had, uh, I had two goggles on with those tear offs, you know, I ran. So you ran two sets of two goggles. sets of goggles. So you had one. Yeah. one on and then another one on. Wow. Yeah. And there's, and then like, I, I planned on taking them off after the start because the start was just toast, but I was like pulling tear offs out here, you know? And I'm like, this is uh, fun. I could keep going with this. Like I can't see anywhere near on the side of me cause I got two goggles on, but I can keep going. So I ran 10th and I ran 10th for a while. And then eventually pulled those goggles, kept going. And, uh, and then I got passed by Baggett, Benny Blos, Weston Pike, my buddy Freddie Noren, who was also pitting with us and driving with us to some of the races in 2017. Um, and I ended up 15th that day, but it was still a really cool experience. Yeah, that's mud. awesome. Yeah. But and then qualifying was a lot of fun. Um, I think the same day I was like with, I would always try to go first in qualifying, even now when I do, you know, even though I'm just a media guy and I'm just going to try to qualify, I'd still try to go first, you know? And uh, like, Unidale, you have a couple turns and then you have the the first the the, the start goes yep. for the lap times and there's a picture of me like ahead of tomac off the jump i got a couple pictures of me ahead of tomac in practice <laughs> that's sick. yeah and uh and like i was like no nah, dude like i want to i want to get out first and uh it was just a really cool experience and i respect him like 100 percent. but uh but that was cool so i got a good qualifying lap and um yeah, so Unadilla, That's 2017, awesome. pretty fun, pretty fun memories. It was cool. And then, so when did you start kind of going like, all right, I'm sort of getting done with the racing? Like, how long did it take? What was your headspace like? Yeah, you know, you mentioned burnout a little bit. Like, did you kind of just get to that point where you're like, all right, I'm not going to win a championship. I'm not going to get a factory ride. Or like, how did it kind of work for you mentally? So. I met my now wife in 2017 and it was pretty funny. She, uh, so she knew Freddie Noren and my father-in-law, Chris Cole, he knew Freddie and helped Freddie out. And so Chris was cheering for me in 2017 at Hangtown or Glen Helen National. And I thought I was cool. I just had a bunch of fans cheering for me, but it was really him who got 
Ashley, my now wife, and other friends around them to cheer for me, you know. So on the site lap, I saw him, and then every lap, I saw him. So the next day, uh, Freddie was going mountain biking, and with his wife, my now wife, and a couple other friends, they were going mountain biking at Greer. And they stopped by, picked up a bike pump, and uh, just to pump up tires and stuff before they go mountain biking. And so I, so I met my wife there. But that kind of leads into, you know, later on, we started dating that year, and then, you know, I wanted to get married. But I was still living off my parents' income, and uh, it was like doing everything I could to try to make money racing to someday, you know, make yeah, a living. Yeah, provide for family. Exactly, yeah. provide yeah. for a family. So yeah. 2017 race, did well, earned national number 71. Uh, 2018, I did Supercross. Um, I did the first three weekends of the year, I did Arena Cross. My brother did too. Um, got, we both got our points. He turned pro, or he did Supercross 250 East. Um, and then I jumped into West. I did like first three rounds of Arena Cross, survived it. It was just gnarly. Dude, <laughs> chaos. It's, it's, as cha- it's as chaotic as Matt Burkeen's videos make it seem, dude. Really? Like, oh, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. So, uh, so then did those three rounds, and I went straight from there to Glendale Supercross. Yeah. And then went to Oakland, San Diego. And it was like each weekend I got better but didn't make the main. So my dad's like, well, why, why would you go back to Milestone? You can ride Milestone and Lake Elsinore and Hemet, like super good. But, but it's totally different when you get in the stadium. The track's way gnarlier than what a p- privateer then can you're ride. you're practicing on, yeah. Exactly. So we went to... Uh, we went to Dallas. I raced the 450 class on my 250 the next weekend. And he's like, yeah, let's just go there and s- just get more experience in the stadium. So I did that. Um, that was gnarly. Watched, <laughs> I was like pretty good off the start, surprisingly, in the heat race. And I think I think Weston Pike or Barsha or somebody hit midair off one of the triples. And I like just missed them on the start of the heat race. And I was running like top five in the heat race. No way. Yeah, and a 450 class on a 250. And that only lasted for a fraction of a second but yeah. a couple of laps later I was shuffled back and that was it but then my dad's like well this is way better than Milestone let's just keep going so we went to Tampa um, then we got to ride at Baggett's house which is a next level learning from him and he was just awesome to hang out with so rode there went to Atlanta and I went to Daytona and then we after that I was like okay instead of driving you know New York or somewhere else let's just go home regroup and get ready for Seattle Salt Lake in Vegas. So I did that. Um, yeah, I went back and raced. I qualified for the main at Seattle, qualified for the main at Salt Lake, and then just missed it at the Las Vegas uh, East-West shootout. Yep. My brother was racing East. I was racing West. I was, you know, it would have been so cool. It would have been sick. He, he was like running up front in his heat race, like ahead of Jeremy Martin. I think he finished second behind Jeremy Martin at the time. And I was, you know, one off in the heat race and one off in the LCQ, I uh, think, from racing against my brother in Supercross, which would have been so cool. But uh, but yeah, so that was my Supercross experience. And then outdoors, I did Hangtown, struggled, 450 class. I jumped from 250 to 250 Supercross, 450 back for outdoors. And then struggled at Hangtown. Glen Helen, I, was, I changed my bike a ton, slowed it down a lot, which you would appreciate, <laughs> making it easier to ride. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, and then qualified really well. And then I was just going around a, a tough block. It was like a tractor tires on the inside of the track. And I, I was on a slow lap. So I was just like leaning over to like not hit my, it was at the very top of the mountain, right? You like jump up the hill, yeah. go around the tractor yeah. tire and then yeah. jump back yeah. down. So no fans are up there. Nobody's up there. And, and like the markers just, that's how they were. And I leaned to miss, miss hitting it just like on a slow lap and I tagged it with my front, my handlebar and my, my bad shoulder that you mentioned was out of, in a bad spot and then yanked it out of socket. Uh. I told the flagger like pull on my shoulder and he pulled on it, put it back in and I like tried to ride, but I was like, no, that was it. So I needed surgery. And so then I was done. So long story short, that goes back to my wife's story I'm talking about where I wanted to marry her. I wanted to make a living racing. I realized I had no good results to build off of, to build any kind of program for 2019. So let's just, let's just call it good, you know? Yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's a big story too. Like uh, I was, you know, questioning if I should race or not the next year, like what yeah, I was going to do. Yeah, it's a massive decision. Dude. Like, and you're talking about it now as a, you've got a regular job essentially. Like it's a very cool job. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's a pretty big transition 
to just be like, okay, I'm done racing. It's all you've ever done since you were four, five years old. Yep. To be like, all right, that's it. And cool to cool to hear that it's like, oh, I want to get married. I want to be able to support my family. Like, because yep. you come from a decent family. So it's <laughs> like you, you kind of, you'd have freedom to sort of do it whatever way you wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. But it's like you go, all right, no, this is what I want. This is yep. the way I want to do things. That means I gonna have to go over here so totally. it is a pretty big decision yeah yeah no it is massive decision i mean i you know was getting good support from a lot of sponsors i wasn't making a living racing but i had everything i needed to race motocross you know given for free or uh, twisted development building engines fmf given exhausts and uh paul from per taper giving me handlebars chain sprockets um mach one was giving it bikes like we had a lot of good stuff going. Um, HD Supply was helping us out a lot. So, yeah, it was really hard to give that up. All the Free Fox gear and Free Fox clothes, you know, <laughs> yeah. that have a name on it. It was just so cool. And then even harder was giving up, like, Avo, my mechanic. So uh, when I, I told you he went to that SXMX school, um, he didn't know a lot about motocross before he went there. So we went to Glen Helen. He's like, dude, that 15 guy looks pretty fast. I'm like, that's Dean Wilson. You don't know who <laughs> yeah, Dean Wilson is? No shit, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, Dean yeah. Wilson. Yeah. And so he didn't know Dean Wilson. And then he didn't know who Mitch Payton was. Like we taught him, you know, so I taught him everything, not, not everything. Well, like the history. I, t- you know. I, you know, with me, he learned, you know, the whole industry and like the Rockstar Husky team because my brother's riding for them. Like they loved him. They would have hired him in a second. Like everybody loved him. He became friends with everybody, friends with all the pros, like everybody. So then, uh, you know, it was just such a cool experience working with him. We were like the d- dynamic duo, you know, everything we did was just a ton of fun. And then training with Ramsey was a ton of fun and like just an honor and like super cool. And then working with Eddie was super cool. So giving up racing meant that I was giving up my mechanic, giving up, you know, the other the cool stuff that came with it. And, you know, at the same time, like, you know, I'm a Christian. So my faith, I, I'm, I got to work on, like in motocross, we define ourselves by your results, right? Mm. And like what people think of you and and like you're only as good as your last race. Like that's a common saying in our sport. And for us, for you and me now as media guys, it's you're only as good as your last podcast or your, <laughs> your yeah. last video, yeah. you know, or like if you've had a couple- Yeah, there's one of 10 on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, and right. And you're like, how good was your video compared to your last 10? Totally, right? So it's like, you're only as good as your last thing. But so as a Christian, I was always as a racer too, trying to remember like, I'm not defined by my results. I'm not defined by what other people think of me. Like, you know, that that's just not the case. Right. So with that, like, okay, God, do you want me to keep racing and keep doing this? Like, what's the benefit of that? Like, well, I get cool stuff. I get to go cool places. (laughs) Like, or God, do you have bigger plans for me that are less focused on what I need and what I want and maybe more focused on another story, like the next chapter. Right. And, And like I already mentioned, I didn't want to be the guy that just hung on to, racing longer than I should. Like I always was, I was skeptical about that before I turned pro, like maybe I need a job at Fox. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. So I finally had the motivation and to like, in my wife or in my girlfriend at the time, like I want to marry this girl. We're not living together. We're not uh, enjoying the benefits of being married yet. So we're, you know, waiting to do that until, until we can get married. So yeah. because of that, it's like, we're gonna have strict boundaries. Um, wild story that you might like uh i didn't we didn't even kiss until we got married so like we wow. when we first started dating and i like telling this story uh to a lot of my friends but when we first started dating we were we were i was like yeah will you be my girlfriend okay can i kiss you and so we we started kissing and uh and then i told you like we didn't enjoy the benefits of being married until we were married yeah. so to keep those boundaries it was harder when you're kissing, right? And, yeah. so, and it's harder to be a racer and train when I want to go over to my girlfriend's house and, and hang out, you know? Yeah. So uh, so I got to the point where I was like, hey, this is starting to get sinful here. Like this is starting to cross the line. I shouldn't, like this is going down a road I don't want to go down until we're married. Yeah. So let's cut the, let's, let's stop here. What was her background faith was? She was a Christian. Okay. So her dad, this is a big part of the story too. Her dad raced motocross. He was a pro, but he was also a pastor uh, l- later on as well. And then he got into uh, heavy equipment rental. And so, you know, he was deeply involved in moto and racing. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so it was kind of a perfect storm for me to got to meet a guy who's a Christian, 
but it's also pasta and then it's daughter. But yeah. also that he races yeah. motocross and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. So that's kind of like the backstory of my wife and I. So I was serious about wanting to marry her. It's but, really cool, man. Like it's very, very commendable. It's very. It's. Uh, I guess getting rarer these days. Like yeah. it's not the traditional route that a lot of people go down nowadays. Yeah. And it's funny. So like my wife and I, we got separated by COVID for two years. Yeah. So yeah, kind of went through a crazy long process. Right. And like you, you, you have to learn, you like there's, you have to dig deeper in mm-hmm. your relationship when it's not, when it like, you can't be physical. You know? 100%. And it's like, man, we had so many Dude, I'm I'm stoked you had that those two years. It was gnarly, dude. It was uh, it was very, very, very hard. Yeah, and it was like there was a lot of a lot of testing times through it, you know. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's different in a way, but it's I guess the there's a similar thing in like yeah, where you have to focus on other things. Yeah, but at the time, you know, you had to right because you couldn't see her for two years. So yeah. So you like, I imagine now you're going to look back and be proud of those two years because you guys built the foundation more before you got married. Right. And yeah. the same thing for my wife and I, like, um, we, you know, when I want to go to her house, like I'm going to go to, to hang out with her. Or if I want to go on a date with her, I want to go to hang out with her, not because of any benefits I'm going to get, yeah. um, w- along with that. So there was, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different mindset. And then you actually get to know her (laughs) before, (laughs) you know what I mean? And that's like, as a Christian, that's the foundation you're building as, you know, anybody trying to build a relationship, like you, yeah, you, you start on the foundation first, you build the, build the foundation and then you build up from there. And so that was us. Um, pastor recommended a book. It was like, like I introduced her to a buddy of mine who was a pastor in the kids ministry at our church. And I was like, yeah, this is my new girlfriend. He's like, Oh cool. Here's your book. (laughs) What you you need to know to get before you get married. And I was like, we read through this book together. I was like, Oh, it brought up a lot of good points. Like, okay, well we want another book. And then we, you know, we read all kinds of books together and, and it was just like knocking off all these questions that you would have before you get married. Like as a, I was nine, I was 20, 21. Like you, you think you're not ready to get married, but you, I guess maybe, I was in a different headspace, but, uh, but you're not like reading these books and kind of going down the, the, the road of like, yeah, the honorable way to do it. Then it made it much more clear that I was like, okay, yeah, I am ready. Okay. Yeah. Like all these things are lining up. Right. And, uh, you know, if you go around, if you, if you go from the start, the, the starting gate to the finish line and you're just enjoying the podium at the finish line all the time, well, you don't have the whole race in between to, to, to lean back on, if, yeah. if that makes sense. So, yeah. so that was uh, some of the motivation behind it. It's like, you know, I wasn't going to live with my girlfriend before we got married. And, and I'm so proud and so thankful that we did that. So long story short, you know, we were dating for a year, engaged for six months. Um, and uh, now we've been married for four and a half years. <laughs> That's and, so sick. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's like, you know, wouldn't change anything for the world. And so she's, she's amazing. And, and like people watching this, you know, you might be a motocross, other guys might be motocross guys. Like, I don't want a girl who, who rides moto or who knows anything about moto. And I was on the same boat. Like, yeah. I want to get somebody who's totally out of, outside of moto, but, but then I'm, you know, her dad raced moto full time, her brother rode and raced. And so, but she was the right girl. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's pretty cool that like, I can lean back on, like, she knows she doesn't know the industry or she doesn't know everything. But, but she kind of gets she it. She gets it, yeah. 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 Her dad has had a million surgeries. He's hurt himself way too many times. <laughs> so you know? she knows the program. Dude, she's like a doctor, yeah. yeah she's yeah. like a full nurse. So I'm super proud. But long story short, that was like my story of like yeah. why I stopped. Yeah. So I could go on and talk about her forever. But yeah, Supercross did two rounds outdoors, got hurt. Afterwards, I'm talking to my dad a couple of days later, like, yeah, I want to get married. You know, I, I'm, but you know, he'll pay for me to keep racing next year. Yeah. But like, I'm not going to live off of my dad, you know, the other way. So, uh, so my dad kind of like talking to him, he's like, yeah, well, you could always, you know, not race and go get a job and do this or that. And like that talk helped me, you know, get to the next step. And then another big story. And I kind of tell this in my real testimony, whenever I share about like a big thing that God has done in my life is, uh, 
my mechanic Ava I mentioned. So he was in the shop preparing the bikes to get ready for next year, like going to sell old bikes, buy new bikes, prepping them all, getting ready to sell. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know if I'm going to race next year or not. Like I'm in the middle of deciding this. And as a racer, that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> and uh, so I was praying like, God, just like lead me here. Like, give me wisdom. I don't know what I should do. So I would go out. I talked to Ava. I'm like, Hey, you want to grab, are you, how's it going? You know? And he's like, Hey, you want to grab lunch today? I'm like, yeah, I'll grab lunch totally. And then we keep talking. I'm like, Hey, just, just so you know, like you're getting these bikes ready to sell, but I'm not sure if we're going to sell them. Cause I don't know if I'm going to race next year, but you still have a job. Like you can still work here. Like my dad's not going to cut you off the payroll. Like you're still go good for a while. And you know, we'll help you as long as you need to. Like, and I'm not sure I might still race, but I'm just yeah. trying to figure out, I want to let you know where my head's at. And he's like, well, that's actually what lunch was about. Um, I got offered a job to go work for my best friend's dad back in Wyoming. And he wanted to go home. He was going to make great money. He was going to be able to play hockey again. Cause he loves hockey. He's just, he's yeah. just a nut dude. He just loves taking people out. And, <laughs> and uh, so he wanted to go home. I'm like, wow. Okay. So like, even if I kept racing, you'd want to go home. He's like, well, yeah, like I've had a blast. He's us two years, three years, but like, so I just made it so much easier, dude, honestly, like God clearly like put laid down the hammer on me. And I was like, okay, well, if you want to race next year, you got to find a new mechanic. You know, I'm like, I've raced every race, but those first two with this guy Yeah, and we've done everything together. And so, yeah, it was just so much clearer. And now I was like, all right, thank you, Lord. Like you answered my prayer. Like I needed, yeah. I needed confirmation and you just made it, made it easy for me. And then you know, the story goes on six months later, I'm healing from my shoulder injury. I'm I'd taking real estate classes, thinking about selling houses. I thought about doing construction, thought about doing a couple of things. And then it's like, uh, Jamie Ellis from twisted. He's like, Hey, motocross action needs another guy. I think you'd be a great fit for it. You're not going to make a ton of money, but like you can still ride. I think you'd be good at it. And I was like, oh, yeah. So then my first day, so then I, you know, even getting the job wasn't easy. Like I showed up every day, not every day, but I showed up quite a few times taking photos for free. Like, you know, I mentioned already, like talking to my boss, Daryl, calling him, emailing him. And basically I got the job because I could, I wrote him an article. He asked for an article, gave me a timeline and, and I, he liked it. And, uh, and my first day working for MXA was testing Austin Forkner's 2017 oh, or 2018 race bike, you know? Yeah. And, uh, backstory on that, like, Growing up, my parents made me email all my sponsors after every race and tell them, thank you, send photos, like, here's how it went. That's so cool. Eh? Yeah. And it was like, at the time, I didn't want to sit on my mom's computer and type out these emails, but it taught me how to talk to people. It taught me how to write and it taught me how to, you know. Well, engage with sponsors. Exactly. And, yeah. So then that led to, um, you know, I actually wrote an article for Racer X in 2010 when we raced the Junior World Championships in France and that got published and that was really cool. And Davey was super nice for letting me do that. But yeah, long story short, like those kind of experiences built me up to where I could get this job in MXA. And they're like, he can write an article. We're not worried about his spelling. We know he can ride dirt bikes. We'll teach him how to take photos and tests. And then I got the job. That's so, so sick. I, I like, I could talk forever about all the stories and there's so many people that were huge parts of it that I'd love to yeah, dude. Shout we, out. We got but. time. <laughs> we definitely got time. Cool. Uh, I, I appreciate it. You know what's wild? I, I want to know what it was like moving in with your wife once you got married. So you never, you didn't live together until no. the like the day after you got married. So the did you like stay over each other's house? So you never slept together, no. like even in the same bed at no, all? No. So honeymoon, wedding Bo first. Bo honeymoon, Bora Bora. <laughs> That's so epic. on uh, on the huts on the water. Yeah, yeah. As, I, I don't think he can get much better, you know. Yeah. And it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It was just, yeah, just me and her long flight from LAX to to Bora Bora, and yeah, it was an awesome week. I mean, and then from there, like it was not not hard at all. Like I I I my friends who say like, oh, you know, I need to live with her before to get used to it. This and that. It's yeah. like we did all of our homework. Yeah. And it would, it, we knew how to work through it. Like, and yeah. going off of the Bible and going off of God's word, like it, it, I call the Bible a, a owner's manual, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like it, yeah. it really does come to life when you read it. And it really does like, you know, you're kind of a spiritual guy yourself, right? Like, but when you get into the 
to the word, it, it, it does come to life and it lays out ground rules and lays out, you know, how to, how not to, yeah. and, and how a wife should be, how a husband should be. And, uh, you know, how I should be the leader, but I also shouldn't, you know, rule over her, how yeah. I should, you know, protect her, but also not, uh, you know, be hard on her kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, it just, it was a easy fit. And it's like funny because we've been married four and a half years, but every year I try to, t if she was here, I'd say, we're like, yeah, it's five and a half, right? Yeah. yeah six, right? Six, yeah. you know, next year, seven, right? Seven, yeah. right? So for me, it feels like, kind of feels like we've been together forever because we work so well together and it's so, such a good relationship and and that's not to say things haven't been hard um we've been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years like that's been pretty hard like there's definitely there's definitely roads like roadblocks along the way yeah, yeah. i don't i definitely don't want to say like oh because we did it the christian way you know that it's things, perfect and it's things, flawless. Yeah. yeah yeah and like as a christian that's not the way like it's it's because you're a christian you're not that doesn't mean life is easy it actually yeah. means life's going to get harder and i I, you said it was kind of rare to do it this way. Like I tell my friends, it's kind of punk rock now yeah. to live as a Christian because it's <laughs> yeah. more normal to not, yeah. right? A hundred percent. So, so it's a little more, now it's like counterculture to live as a Christian. And, and so I, I, uh, yeah, basically like it, there is hard things you go through. Like the Bible promises, if you become a Christian that you will go through hard things, but like God's going to work through it no matter what it is. Like, yeah. even if it's the worst of worst, you know, I have friends of cancer, friends that have passed away, friends who have lost their parents, friends, all these things, you know what I mean? That doesn't mean that stuff goes away, but it, 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 it wraps it up to where, and the end, ultimately, like there's, there's two places you go after you pass away. And it's ultimately, it's the security, security of knowing where you're going to go. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I like to say it's like a parachute. Right. And, yeah. and so there's, there's, pastors and people that will say like put this parachute on and it'll make your life better right somebody says become a christian follow god read the bible it'll make your life better you'll be more successful at work you'll race better like all these things god please help me win you know that kind of stuff that's not really the, that's not that's not true that's yeah. not true that's not how it works yeah. Yeah. right even christians like trey canard the, the most awesome christian he's had a lot of a lot of issues right a lot of crashes and injuries and stuff. Bro, talk about, I mean, I said it on the podcast with him, but talk about a guy that's had his faith tested. Like, mm -hmm. you know. You he's done an amazing job representing it. Dude, yeah. And I I definitely love people like him, people like yourself to where it's like, there's one thing to talk to talk, but there's another thing to walk the walk, you know. And it's like, you just, yeah, no matter what your beliefs are, you just have to respect people that walk the walk, you know. For it's sure. Like, and for me, I'd say I'm definitely more of like, I guess, just quote unquote spiritual in a sense, you know, and I think definitely like in line with a lot of Buddhist and like more Eastern sort of yeah. philosophy to, but it's like, you're so right that it's like, it doesn't make your life easier in terms of the things that happen to you, but it's like the way that you respond yeah. to the things in life. Like you don't, yeah. there's like a Buddha saying where, the Buddha basically says like you can suffer from the same arrow twice. Mm -hmm. So it's like you get shot by an arrow. Yes, you're going to get, you're going to suffer from that. Mm -hmm. But then there's like another layer of suffering. That's like the human suffering, like how you personally feel about it. Not, so that's this kind of suffering that you can let yeah. go of and accept in a sense. Yeah. And, and so it becomes the same thing, whether it's like, whether you're Christian or whether you, wh whatever you believe, it's like the same with, you know, being in Dubai, man, I know so many amazing Muslims now. Just unbelievable. Just yeah. guys like you, the practice the way that you practice, have faith the way that you practice, yeah. but in that, and but walks the walk, yeah. and like radiates the, the same yeah. kind of energy. And it's like, I think that becomes the challenge in life is like, okay, what do you believe in? And do you live that belief? Is, totally. it, is it through your actions that you show what you believe in or is it just through your words yeah yeah i have a couple of muslim friends from kuwait that oh, come over yeah, and, yeah, and ride yeah, here yeah, yeah. and they stay with dennis stapleton and yep. they're like some of my close friends and uh one of them was a groomsman in my wedding and wow yeah so we, his name's khalid khalid yeah but we call him kevin you know that's that's his, his, <laughs> yeah. it, he's so funny dude but uh but yeah i so i mentioned the parachute like people think of 
so like, and, and it's an example and like Ray Comfort, he's one of my favorite pastors to follow. And he gives this example a lot. Uh, if you're on an airplane and the stewardess walks up to you and says, Hey, take this parachute. It's going to improve your life and make your life better. You know, you'll win more races. You'll have a more comfortable flight. You know, it'll make your seat more comfortable. Okay. Well this parachute, I don't know how much they weigh nowadays, but let's just say it's 40 pounds or 30 pounds. It's enough to save you if you jump out of the plane. Right. You put that on your, on yourself. You're, you're hunched you over. You have to carry all the time. You're in that, yeah. well, you're in that airplane and nobody else is wearing one. So they're looking at you like you're funny. Like, hey, why are you wearing that parachute, dude? Like, that's kind of weird. And it's uncomfortable. Like it's easy to, you know, your back's getting sore, this and that. And so they say, hey, it'll improve your flight. And you put it on because you want to give it a try. So you put the parachute on and it's not improving your flight. People are making fun of you. Yeah. The it's kind of sticking out into the aisle and the stewardess trips on and knocks coffee on your, <laughs> yeah. on your laptop and fries your laptop. That happened to me on the way to Red Bud. It was horrible. <laughs> but... I wasn't wearing a parachute, but you know, you're wearing the parachute. It doesn't improve your life. And a lot of people, I think that's Christianity or even other things, but you know, people will say like become a Christian and, and prosperity gospel of like, yeah, it'll help this, this and that. But the real reason you put a parachute on is because you're going to have to jump. Right. And so the, the, the stewardess that hands you a parachute and says, Hey, here's a parachute. It's going to save your life. We've got to jump at 25,000 feet coming up here soon. I don't know when, but pretty soon you're going to, you're going to want this. You're like, shoot, I'll take it. Hot coffee. You'll take that. People, yeah, people yeah. making fun of you. You're like, why aren't you guys wearing parachute? You guys need to get your parachute on. Right. Yeah. And honestly, that's, that's the true message. That's one of the clear um, parables or, or way that you could kind of see like the message of the Bible that like, yeah, there is a judgment. Like we we're here, we're here to do our best with what we got and the tools that God's given us. But at the end of the day, like what's your trust in? And like, my trust is in Jesus. Like I'm not good enough to make it to heaven on my own. I'm not good enough because I'm nice. You think I'm nice. You <laughs> yeah. know, I let you ride MXA bikes, you know, when you come with us, <laughs> yeah. that's not going to get me to heaven. Like I'm, I say, I give a bunch of money away. Let's say I spend my whole life in Africa feeding the poor. Like, none of those things add up to be good enough. And if you ask anybody, how are you going to get to heaven? It's like, well, I'm a good person, but what are you measuring yourself by? Mm. Are you measuring yourself by your own standards? Cause you know, cause they can get locks. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can all, everybody's got the line right behind them. So, yeah, yeah. so that's the message of that. And that's, you know, how I try to live and, and definitely not perfect, but my trust is not in myself. It's in the parachute. It's in Jesus. And uh, so I guess that kind of wraps up into the story of why my wife and I didn't test drive before we got married yeah. and you know, how we built our foundation. And then that leads into why I didn't, why I stopped racing. Yeah. And you know, for me now getting this job, which is the coolest job in the world. Plus it's a lot of work, you know, but it's the coolest job. And, you know, I believe that God like took me out of racing. Dude, I gave up free dirt bikes, Jamie yeah. Ellis, twisted development <laughs> engines, yeah. Cerakoted. This was when Huskies had the white frames full time. Now the factory editions do, but like yeah. white frames, uh, you know, Dunlop was giving me tires, uh, you know, ETS fuel, like everything sick. Uh, sponsors were- And you just had to go race and ride. Dude, race, ride, hang out with Jackson. It is so much fun. Like that's the one thing I'll take away from the whole world vets prep yeah. is that in, I mean, you saw me out there, you know, like yeah. I was just, I, I put on my blinders. I had all my other shit that I had to do and all my responsibilities. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to this race unfit. Totally. And I just went and rode and man, I, I had so cool. the best time because my focus was so singular and in the couple, the week of vets especially yep. was the best. Yep. Like we worked on bikes Monday Road Tuesday, worked on bikes Wednesday, road Thursday, yeah. worked on bikes Friday, road, road. Yeah. And it was the sickest week ever. And I'd say to people, like I'd say to the boys, I'm like, man, if someone put $5 million in my bank account right now, all I would do is buy more race gas and more tires. Totally, right? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. My life can't get better with money. Like, right? This is as good as it gets for me. Yeah. So like just, you know, to give up that single focus of you just don't, all you have to do is focus on getting better faster eating right sleeping good yeah you kind of can be selfish because it's all towards a goal you know so yeah. that would be hard to give up yeah yeah it honestly is and so i gave it up and then and then i six months later one surgery later you know i end up at this job where it's like i got free dirt bikes yeah, free, yeah. free gear free gear not just perks, from fox yeah. but from a lot of companies you <laughs> yeah. know and i you know 
it's all this cool stuff. And, uh, and even at the time I was like, oh, it's a little bit of a bummer. I've given up my cool Fox helmets for these orange helmets, you know, cause they're just orange. There's nothing like exotic about them. They're just orange helmets. But now it's like, now I'm so proud of the orange helmet. Yeah. And it's a staple. Dude. It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, long story short, like that was, that was pretty cool. And even on the orange helmet, like I was giving up my number, my, my gear, my this and that. But then now the orange helmet is kind of my number, you know, yeah. like no matter what bike or gear or number I'm with, like if it's an orange helmet and it's tall and skinny, it might be me or maybe one of our other guys, but, yeah. but that's, that's the MXA guys. So it's, yeah. it's an honor to really work here and, and be able to ride cool bikes and write articles. And I was an amazing test rider. I wasn't really, wasn't a great test rider when they hired me. I mean, they, they taught me a lot and taught me everything and through Jamie, through, pro circuit through all the companies that we work with, like going to the track, even Ralph Schmidt from TM, uh, TM racing from yep. T TM two yep. strokes, yep. two strokes, four strokes, you know, more off road, but me and me and Ralph spent days at the track working on the TM 300 two stroke project bike, TM 125 and just jetting with him all day riding. And like, he taught me a lot too. And so, uh, so yeah, long story short, it was like, I gave up a lot of cool stuff, but I feel like God picked me right back up yeah, and put me into a, back again. a different job where now I get to race. It's so much fun and I have no pressure. No pressure. You're just out there doing your job. Yeah. And the pressure I had before wasn't from a factory team, a team manager or anybody. And like, and not even my parents, it was just from myself. Like I want to make a living. I want to make it in this sport. I want to keep racing. Like, what am I going to do next year? It's a stressful job being a pro. And like, you know, especially if, if you're not just happy living where you're living you're like if you want to keep making progress it's stressful but now it's pretty fun to get to race with without that stress it's like jody reminds me before every race like hey dude like we'll pay you the same whether you get first or last it doesn't matter you know <laughs> yeah. like just don't hurt yourself you know even then it's he's never really told me that either like yeah just get your work done yeah and just, that's that's yeah. it like yeah. as long as i get my articles done I get my videos done and like as long as everything gets done on time you go race as much as you want do it do whatever you want so uh, it is hard to get all your stuff done and race, you know, yeah. and then it gets stressful when you add in all the other stuff. But, but it, it, that's like the story I was mentioning to you about like burnout, like, you know, it's, it's hard to, to race with all that pressure. And once you take that pressure off, like you perform so much better. Like I train not very much now. I like to go to the gym with my wife. We work out as much as we can and she's more diligent, honestly, than I am. But, uh, I like to train, I like to ride, I like to race, but I don't really train. Mm. Like I'm more just test, do photo shoots, test, do photo shoots, and just a lot of testing, so not a lot of motos. But I feel like I ride better now than I did when I was pro, technically, maybe not as in good endurance and stuff, but still a better rider because I've learned so much more by not getting hurt and just yep. continuing to ride. And, yep. and yeah, You're just getting so much more bike time that's just in a different way. Like I feel... I feel like when you're training to be a professional rider, it's a bit of a hindrance, I think. When I went to Loretta's this year, it was the first time I went. Yeah. And it was just kids fully sending every single lap. It was like they're just being watched constantly. Yeah. No technique, no just full blowing out every single turn. I'm like, <laughs> wait, kids, it's lap one at practice. Totally. Like, you know, there's no, no one gives a prize here. You know? Yeah. Yep. But yeah, that mentality when you're on the clock is so different and you know you're focusing on riding good yeah. and looking good in photos and you know testing bikes so the yeah. speed's not always no. the concern and i feel like you can get so much better at motocross dude just with by doing less almost honestly like honestly i wish i would have done more of this stuff when i was racing like when i raced i had great bikes great suspension uh you know luke boyk he was at wp and then he was at uh race tech and now he's at pro circuit he built suspension last couple of years of racing and um you know had great stuff but i didn't do a lot of testing and i didn't really know how to i didn't know what to look for i didn't really mess with it i was like i feel pretty good so let's just keep going and yeah if i felt really bad we would mess with stuff but most of the time we just keep going and uh and like as a pro you need to show up to the race and you have and outdoors you have t one or two laps and then the clock starts. So you need to be able to get, adapt to the track and go wide open first lap. So you wouldn't even really mess around much at the track. Like you would, every time you get out there, you go wide open right away. 
with Ramsey, we would work on a lot of technique. Like we would do every day you get to the track, you do a standing lap, feet on the pegs lap, no clutch, no rear brake. And that was like your five lap warm up, like doing those things. Yeah. And we would do lots of cool stuff like that. But, um, but now riding different bikes, racing 125s a bunch for the Pasha money races that he puts on at Glen Helen, uh, racing Yamaha one week and Honda the next, you know, yeah. like stock bikes, you know, racing a stock bike. It's just that kind of stuff. I have to compensate for the bike, but then it makes me a better rider and helps me understand the bikes that we're testing more as well. Well, I think too, the fact that you guys ride Glen Helen so much, it's such a unique place. Yeah. I love Glen Helen, by the way. Yeah, I know so you do. For everyone good. that, everyone that, I would say, oh, I'm riding Glen Helen or this, that. There's two camps. Yeah. I feel like it's, who said this the other day? Someone said this word for word. So I can't remember, but this wasn't my line. Yeah. They said, I feel like it's in vogue to hate Glen Helen. It kind of is. And it kind of is. Just like hating Suzuki's. Yeah. People just want to hate Glen. I fucking hate that place. Everybody would say that. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I actually think this might be one of the best motocross tracks on planet earth. Honestly. It's so, I didn't like the vets layout. No? Uh, there was a couple parts where I wish were different. Yeah. But for the most part. But it was oh, challenging. No, it was just, you know what I didn't like was just the inside when they got in the infield in the, like the sandy area. The two lanes. Yeah. And then like how it, you mini Talladega, you come down and it was like that right, left. Like, oh yeah. That was all, pretty tight. Yeah. It was just a bit tight and I yeah. just didn't like that. But the rest of the track I actually <laughs> didn't like. And I didn't like the, uh, the little rhythm section before the finish. Yeah. Uh, that was challenging. Straight. I just, yeah, not a fan of that. But uh, Glen Helen, epic track. Yeah. And the fact that you can go there every Tuesday, every Thursday, there's a race every Saturday. Yeah. Like, and you were right, by the way. I should have raced those races. You should have. I didn't do one. Told you. Yeah. Told you. Yeah. Yeah. But amazing track. And I think the fact that you guys ride there so much, man, you that track changes every day. Yeah. I feel like you never ride the same Glen Helen twice. And the it's such like a specialty track and there's a different way you have to ride it Mm -hmm. um i think it's great for testing bikes and then yeah i just think as your skills like there's it's so wide there's so many lines the hills the up the downs like i just think that place has got everything so riding in one place so much probably helps a lot as well for testing it does like our goal is to test bikes and make sure our articles have as much details as possible so that you know you want to know about the Yamaha 450 hopefully we give you more information and more accurate information than than you can find you know and same thing with every bike so we take our bikes to the dyno every time so pro circuits are dyno well Glen Helen's our dirt dyno yeah like we we try to ride other tracks more often too but it makes the most sense it's the most central for Trevor for Daryl for Jody for Dennis for me like it's the easiest place for us all to meet we own the place basically. <laughs> we don't, but we yeah. do. Like we could walk, ride there any day we want and, you know, get in before the gate opens, stay, at, you know, as long as we want. So that helps. And then, like you said, it is an amazing track. It's a world-class track. So if you shoot anything at Glen Helen, like it's a big deal. Or it's, it's more of a big deal than some of the other tracks. And then, like I said, the dirt dyno, I know how Joe Shimoda's race bike feels there. I know how... Uh, you know, all the, all the new 250s feel there for the last five years that I've ridden the two strokes. I know how they feel there. I know what it's like to race there. I know, um, and I can compare, you know, Joe's bike back to back with, you know, a stock Yamaha 250 or whatever other kick, stock KX 250 to, to a factory pro circuit KX 250, you know, um, we've ridden a lot, yeah, a lot of bikes there. So long story short, it like, it makes the most sense to have like a more consistent training ground. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, it's, more efficient for testing i would say is like ha- knowing exactly what it's all about and we try to get out to the other tracks more often too we dennis is at paul all the time i yep. go to paul sometimes paris is awesome sometimes and lake elsinore as well so we mix it up too when they had milestone open we were like 50 50 almost like milestone glen helen because glen helen was every thursday but if we had stuff to shoot in between we could do milestone yeah but then when milestone closed glen helen opened on tuesday that made things more Glen Helen, you know, and then same thing with Comp Edge, like we could go there before, but then that closed. So it just unfortunately, like it, it condensed down to where it's like, sometimes I'm hitting myself in the head, like, man, we got another video at Glen Helen, uh, yeah. but I'm like, well, it is, it does make the most sense for us. And then it's not a bad place if you got to pick one place for 
the majority of your testing. Yeah, and I just think that it gives the videos a lot of credibility in a sense too. Like, I guess you could look at it in two different ways. But yeah. for me and riding there and knowing what it's like on a bike now, it's such a good place to test. And you're always on an edge. Yeah. Like you're turning on an edge that like you're – feel like there's always bumps on the edge of the tire basically yeah. or when you're leaning so yeah. that brings flex into play like it really highlights stiff chassis really highlights traction yeah like fr- a lot of front end grip is required there and then you've obviously got the high speed some of the lower speed the sand it's more hard pack like it's a it's a crazy place to to ride a bike and i feel like you can get so much knowledge from a motorcycle by wheeling it around there totally totally i mean uh yeah I've, I've had a lot of fun fun there like more on the story part of things like riding stock bikes there uh 2020 what was it 2020 yeah the nationals were a little bit shorter hangtown was the last round and uh dennis stapleton qualified for the paula national on a ktm 450 and he was riding like he was working uh with ktm at the time helping them develop bikes and stuff but yeah, he qualified at Paula and then I was there taking photos all day and I was like, man, I should, I should race Hangtown next weekend, you know, my, and I told my wife, I was like, next year I got to race a national, you know? And she's like, well, there's one this weekend at Hangtown. I'm like, <laughs> Too <soon>. really? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So I called then I called Davy Coombs Sunday after Paula. He helps me get my thing, my license re- renewed real quickly. Uh, I called FXR, the air freighted gear and everybody got bikes together. But long story short, I raced the stock bike. And when I say that, like, I was riding at Glen Helen that week on a stock KTM 450. And it's actually, you know, you feel really good on a stock bike out there. And then it's not as gnarly as a national. And like, I was, I was going fast. Like my lap times were very good compared to the factory riders that were there that day. But, at Glen Helen? Yeah. Yeah. At Glen yeah. Helen. But then, but then on Saturday I was, you know, six, seven, eight seconds off of the same guys that I was close to at Glen Helen. That's crazy. But, eh? but to, I like more on your point of like, it's, it's a unique track. So yeah, I'm comfortable there, but also, uh, you know, it's good for, like you said, testing bikes. Like you have so many different things that'll catch you off guard. Like you could feel like a million dollars at Paula. You could feel like a million dollars at Paris. You could feel a million dollars everywhere else. Cahia going wide open, but then you get to Glen Helen, like it's, it's not going to be the same. Like you're going to, it's going to be a lot harder. So, uh, yeah, like I, it's, it's, it's a good place for testing. And the biggest thing also is just the consistency. Like yeah. no matter if nobody shows up or if everybody shows up, it, it could be smooth at Glen Helen, but it's still going to be better testing than a smooth day anywhere else, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, I definitely, I enjoyed putting my time in there, you know, like I, I wish I got to ride more. I feel like I've rode a fair bit out there, but, yeah. um, yeah, I just loved it. I love the prep, being out there. I love learning the track. And I think it probably changed three or four times since yeah. I was there. Rode it in crazy wind where you couldn't even have your wheels leave the ground yeah. because you'd get blown off the track. And I like, just feel like I saw every condition. Like some, There was one Saturday before Vets and it was so rough. Like coming down the, the only downhill that was open there. Yeah, because everybody's there getting ready for World Vet, yeah. right? And man, it got insane. And then the first day they added the left-hander after um, Talladega. Mm-hmm. That was insanely rough there too. So you could just show up and it'd just be so gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> just a- any day of the week, you just you don't know what you get. Sometimes it was the easiest, smoothest, like cruisiest ride and you could do 420s and feel like a hero yeah and then other times it's just like man i can't even get around this thing yeah no it's 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 pretty cool even like the best time was during covid so there's no traffic to get there oh and they closed for a couple months and we would still go ride and then even when they opened like there was still no traffic because of covid you know and and it was yeah it was nice but uh but yeah glenn Helen, it's a good time so when you you raced the stock bikes at a national. How's that experience? So Hangtown 2020, yeah, raced it that weekend. KTM 450, the 22, no, no, no. Yeah, 20, 2020 model, I guess. Yep. Air Forks and everything. Um, it was gnarly. Yeah, it was gnarly. Hangtown's my hometown race, kind of two hours from where I grew up. 
and I put a Guts wing seat on there. Do you have, have you ridden with that yet? Yeah, I got one in my Dubai bike. Nice. On my Dubai 450. Yeah. I, I rate them, eh? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, so wing, sing, w- wing seat so I could squeeze on the bike better, hold on to it, free traction. I, I call it free money, you know? And then a works connection whole shot device. Both of them are like companies that I used when I was racing and both of them are like 30 minutes from Glen Helen or 30 minutes from Hangtown. Yeah. And both of them are pretty essential. Like you need a, you need a seat cover to ride a national. Otherwise I'm just going to slide off the back and have arm pump and two laps. Yeah. And I need a whole shot device to get a start, but everything else is stock. Um, we did put factory edition wheels on it. KTM wheels aren't the strongest, uh, spokes will come loose. And so we put the factory edition, they're still stock. Technically they come on a stock KTM, but the but factory that, edition the better one, ones. Yeah. yeah. Better ones. So that put graphics on and, and, suspension was way too soft for a national but it was still super fun like plenty of power just stock pipe stock ecu stock engine don't need any more power and suspension was gnarly but i qualified had some fun you know i was like man what am i doing here again but it came out to be a fun video fun article and got a lot of people going and and uh even though like me racing the nationals doesn't get a million views on youtube it's people bring it up throughout the year to where yeah. it's like, it's, it's cool. So, uh, it makes, makes it fun. So then that sparked racing the next year and yeah. And then racing the next year and here we are, you know? Yeah. So how many seconds do you think of like, let's say you took that, that bike and then turned it into a full blown race bike for the next round. Yeah. Or like, let's say they redid Hangtown a week later and you did it on a full blown race bike. How much faster would you be? I honestly, like I wasn't trained, you know, just off the couch, not off the couch. I ride a lot, but not preparing a lot. Um, honestly, maybe a couple seconds better on a better bike, but not that much, you know, it was soft suspension, but you can compensate for that by not breaking as hard, breaking a little earlier, wheeling over the deep holes, the deep bumps, you know, being smarter with your lines. Like you kind of learn how to compensate with a softer suspension and, that's that suspension is amazing like soft suspension like i said i was just as fast in my opinion as some pro riders some factory riders at glen helen on wednesday or tuesday that week but when the track gets rougher you need that extra suspension you need that extra hold up so yeah. the stock stuff was great for for some applications but then obviously the deeper downhills where you're loading the front end a lot forks are super deep in the stroke like just but to, to compensate for that you break a little earlier you lean back a little more, like wheelie over some of those bumps and just kind of make the best with what you got. And so, yeah, long, long story short, maybe two seconds a lap, maybe with like some real suspension, but it takes, even then it takes a lot. Like, so then even if you have good parts, it's only as good as you set yeah. it up, right? Yeah. You could have amazing bike, uh, but if you don't set it up for you, it's it's not going to be so great. Like I rode Caroli's uh, race bike when he raced here and what did he do? 22? Yeah. I rode his 450 and he had just crazy stiff forks. Really? I couldn't believe. Um, but yeah, like his bike was amazing. His engine would definitely help me go faster. His suspension would definitely help me, but it was set up for him. It wasn't set up for me. And I don't, I would, I would be arm pump, you know, 10 minutes in with his forks cause they were so stiff. I don't ride as fast as him. So I'm not going to make him work like he does, you know? And, uh, MXGP, I thought that they would have softer suspension over there. I always thought like softer, they ride motocross year round. They don't have supercross. Like you've talked about it, right? Like yeah. supercross influences how we set up the bikes for outdoors. Yeah. And so these guys have crazy stiff bikes for supercross because you need that for the straight up and down lips, straight up and down whoops. Like you need crazy stiff two by fours in your forks. So then you go, you have one weekend off and you do Hangtown and you need, or Paula or Glen Helen, you need outdoor settings, you know? So it, and you go softer throughout the year. That's why we always thought. Yeah. And I always thought the GP guys, if they only ride outdoors, they have more comfortable setups. They have tracks that are ripped differently. They're not maybe as soft. They ride them on Saturday. They get rough and then they leave them. They just water it. So it's slippery on Sunday morning when they're doing practice and they're sketchy and square edge, but they're not as deep. So I thought softer suspension makes sense. People told me that. I expected that. So I rode Crowley's bike and it was super cross forks and and pedro his mechanic was telling me he's like yeah his settings aren't too far off of super cross forks for our guys like pleasanger and everybody indoors that's crazy and they were way stiffer than dungy what he was running that because he came back yeah uh, pleasanger and the rest of the guys so that was pretty wild um obviously 
Yeah. So long story short, you ask if it'd be that much better. Like you could throw a million parts on my bike, but unless I set it up yeah, for it's me. Yeah, set up, right. So that kind of goes into it. Like, did I get time to set it up? Because yeah. like my other bikes I've done, um, so that was 2020. I raced one national, 21. I did Honda at Paula and I did a Cowie at Hangtown. And then I did a Husky at Washougal and a KTM at the Paula too, because they went back there for the second time. Yeah. And I didn't have enough time prepping each bike. So like I had a cool parts on there. Like at Ka Hangtown, I had Joe Shimoto's suspension on my KX450 SR. So the bike was sick and it was actually really good. Like, yeah, it was more just the rider probably that. that yeah, but you didn't have to, you didn't get to fully set it up. So no. it was kind of just like, all right, there you go. This is great suspension, but it's not. Make exact. it work. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is fine. Like, that's my specialty now is basically hopping on anything like Carson Brown does it to another level. Yeah. He, he hops on like yeah. the vintage, the sketchy, the, this, the, that. And then for me, it's like, I hop on a lot of different bikes and I can go a good speed on each one. Maybe not for long, but, uh, I can at least qualify for the national and run up there for a little, for a little bit. So, uh, so yeah, that was pretty wild. What, what do you make at KTM's fork switches throughout last year's outdoors? Going to going to the Air Forks is awesome, right? Well, so they, I, you might know more about what exactly they did, but basically everyone starts on 52s and yeah. it's like, that's it. That's what we're running. And then you start seeing Plessinger's got just normal cone valves that you can buy. And then he's got just the Air Forks with the cartridge inserts. So like, what do you make of that whole year and, and KTM kind of like just letting them do their thing? Because I, I heard as well, sorry. I heard last, not 2023, 2022, Cooper ended up just going and buying a stock 450. Really? And he started just taking that to the right. I think that's where like the relationship kind of soured a little bit. When he, he bought that when he rode like the GNCC or off-road stuff last year, you're saying? I think it was towards the end of the 22 outdoor season. Yeah, when he was but, that. But when he, he wasn't riding yeah, outdoors, he was, yeah, yeah. he was doing his summer off, right? Yeah. But I think the thing that led to that, whatever was before that, I'm pretty sure he was just like, I'm just going to ride this stock bike, stock frame, everything. Hmm, that's funny. So, but yeah, so what do you make of that whole suspension journey on that new chassis? I think they just watched your podcast and heard you talk about how stiff the 52 mils are and <laughs> then just went and they're like, hey, this guy's got a point. Well, yeah, you know. I, hey, I, wouldn't, give, I wouldn't put it past them, honestly. Like, yeah, you've brought up some good points that they're super stiff. And uh, I think people are realizing that, but... But Vial still got him on this year. Yeah, but at the Husky launch, like Malcolm had him on, but uh, looked like I didn't look close enough. But uh, Craig had some production size forks on there as well. Yeah. So even for Supercross, I, I don't know if that's what he's racing on, but pretty interesting. But yeah, long story short, I mean the fifty-two mil forks I rode him on uh, Cooper Webb's three hundred two-stroke straight rhythm bike. Mm. We tested that. It had some fifty-twos on there. That was gnarly. Um, I wadded on that thing at Milestone. It's a pretty, really? fun, pretty funny video. Yeah, yeah. It's really how it works. Like you, you film all day, everything's going good, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, I get an iPhone clip," and I and I was like railing the inside, and I I was just sending it, but then I hadn't hit the outside in a couple laps, and I got a little too confident, and then hit the outside, and whew, no, on his two stroke. Yeah, it wasn't his race bike. It was the rib the bike he did at Straight Rhythm, but that was funny. But uh. Yeah, I rode him on that bike and rode him on Crowley's bike. And I think that's the only time I've ridden on the 52s, but bigger, stiffer, stronger. And then, yeah, the 48 mils, like what I can buy, what I raced with, those are still big, stiff, strong, but not as big, stiff, strong. And then the air forks are honestly not bad. And that's what we saw those guys raced with air forks last year towards the end of outdoors. Um, and that was pretty interesting to see, pretty fun to see because a lot of people – that watch our videos and read our articles are like, man, air forks suck, this and that. Well, they're using it, you know? Yeah. They, they're, they're modifying it. They're making it stiffer for them to ride, but that's still usable. And so as long as they, they check it. Were they cool. on air cone valves? No. Just the stock fork? Yeah, stock fork, basically. Yeah, just like revalving a stock set of forks. Wow. Yeah, pretty interesting, huh? That's insane. So my brother, he does... So uh, I, did, I don't know if you met Franco at the... I think you introduced me to him. Yeah, okay. So uh, he does all Maddie's suspension at home. He does all Jack suspension. Like he's nice. a bit of a G. Yeah. And so he takes the stock fork, DLC coats the bottom, Kashima coats the top, 
SKF seals on the inside and then he does the cone valve insert, insert with yeah. like his own spec. Dude, those forks are mint. Really? Like they tested and tested at Glen Helen, like Franco standing on the hill, just like watching watching him come down. That's cool. And uh, yeah, he got those things going so good. That's and I, I got cone valves on my bike in Dubai and they're like super heavy. Like it just, they're not crazy good in yeah. my opinion like yeah. and you get those just the stock air forks put the insert in it and then you do all the coatings and stuff and you have mid suspension it's pretty impressive honestly um dal sogio sent us some forks recently you tested yeah i rode those yeah, ones. yeah yeah that those was were, pretty good they were built off of i don't i haven't you know got the official word from dal sogio but they're from italy it's like a complete fork and they make dropping kits but that fork had it's basically, it's a bladder fork and it's built off of the 2014 and I think it's 2015, 2014 fork, the WP The had, WP one. Which is yeah. my favorite fork. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then they, they were good, eh? Yeah. And then they came out with the 4CS fork and that was horrible. And then they came out with the air fork. But the fork before the 4CS was always everybody's favorite. That was my favorite when I was racing amateur and stuff. And uh, yeah, so that those forks were awesome. Like you tested them too. Like yeah. pretty good. Yeah. But the the... 48s like the cone valves are nice when when you are hitting nationals when you are hitting big heavy bumps like they do make the front end feel pretty predictable yeah, like you planted and planted, stable you know yeah. where you yeah. know where you're gonna go yeah but I've done even air to spring back to back many times KTM is like hey what do you think you know uh, back to back uh, different suspension companies have done back to back but I sometimes like the light feeling of the air fork yeah. and just how it reacts so. Um, and then even like you look at the star racing Yamaha team and even pro circuit for a while, like running, they run air forks all the time. Like yeah. star, I'm pretty sure is all the time running air forks, um, 250 and 450. So, uh, Ricky Gilmore, you know, Tomax yeah. guy, he, he's, he's a wizard. He, I, I'll, I'll use your language. He's a G, you know, like <laughs> yeah. he's a G and, uh, he's from Australia as well. And he's, he's, he's got it going on over there at KYB. So yeah, I've never ridden with those air forks but it's just always fun that he, those guys are running them yamaha doesn't come stock with spring forks people don't even think about the fact that yamaha guys riding with air forks and you know i understand the frustrations of air forks like it sucks you have to check your tire pressure that's a given when you show up to the track unless you have nitro moose in there but you know checking your air pressure is just another thing to check and it's just another thing to do before you get on your bike and like all of us I, me, it's different, and you, it's different because we work in the industry. But if you For the work, average go up. yeah, if you show up on Saturday morning, you want to gear up and go. Like you have, you know, a couple hours to ride before you got to get home for your kid's birthday, or yeah, you know, whatever. Like you want to get your motos in and have fun, and you want to be tired when you leave. You don't want to spend any time tightening spokes or checking sprocket bolts or anything. Like you just want to ride. I understand that. So that is the frustration with air forks. Like you leave them out in the sun. You know, your bike's not under an easy up and like pressure goes up a little bit so and it's confusing like it's confusing it's, it's just hard to understand sometimes but your spring your air pressure is your spring rate yeah and that's just how it goes yeah yeah so, uh i rode with the mx tech 49 mils yeah you rode with them yet i've ridden with them a couple times but not a ton but they're actually coming here on tuesday and we're gonna ride a couple two strokes oh really? yeah they're oh, driving sick. all the way out here from from illinois oh wow yeah. i'm gonna be at Glen Helen this week actually tuesday yeah we'll be there yeah so i got a um I, I got a dude nick rodriguez is his name he's coming on the podcast next wednesday nice but he's one of the, the gnarliest jiu-jitsu dudes sick. in the world sick. he's 260 pounds he's like six foot four the Jeez. guy he's like rob gronkowski uh -huh. he grew up racing moto really yes yeah, so, and he was liking the podcast a bunch on instagram so i messaged him i'm like hey what's the deal like do you know moto or what he's like man i grew up racing like he's still got 247 like his racing number in his uh <laughs> In his Instagram handle Sick. and stuff. So anyway, I'm taking him riding Sick. on Tuesday nice. before he does the podcast. But um, that's cool. I'll be sick because I've got those MX Tech forks in Australia. Yeah, and uh, I rate them, and Sick. their shock is awesome too. Sick, sick. Yeah, no, it'd be cool. I'm uh, excited to meet him. I haven't actually met him in person, but they're coming out filming a CR500, a CR250, and a CR125 that they Dude. all built up uh, into aluminum frames and stuff. So it'll be a fun little project. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to piss real quick. Go on. for it. Yeah, crazy ride, dude. Um, anyway, we'll get back into it. Um, so might as well just keep talking about KTMs. Sure. Have you rode the new one, the new frame? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Is so it I, yeah. So when I went to Austria, did you see that trip? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we went to Austria. We went and toured the KTM factory and got to ride over there with those guys. And then we got to race an Austrian national. And oh, I was, sick. Yeah, dude, it was next level. It was next level. So um, yeah, the the KTM test riders were here for World Vets last year. And you saw them, they were here again this year. Um, and they, you know, after that, hanging out with them. And they, I did an interview with one of them, Mickey Stoffer. He's been longtime KTM test rider for forever. Um, his boss, Mandy, uh, Ed Linger, he, well, Mickey lined it up, Mandy made it happen and we got to tour the whole factory. And, and, uh, so then I did get to ride the factory edition, you know, a couple months before it came out and now it's, it's not even really out yet, but, uh, they're going to make announcements soon that they, they changed the frame and changed a couple of little things and a couple of really cool things. So when are you going to post this? Why? When would it? When? When could I wait to post it? A couple, couple weeks. Uh, yeah, I, th I think what today's the seventh. I think if you wait to like the fourteenth or something. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Let's just fucking go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's next level. Really? The frame is good, but like I didn't get to compare the frame with the stock frame or with the current frame, so it's hard to tell. Like, is it five, ten, fifteen percent better? Like, how much better is it? It's still the same bike, but it's better. But the the new ECU on the new factory editions is next level. So really? they've been working with Lit Pro. So you have to wait until this comes yeah, out. I'll, Otherwise, I'll, I'll get in sure. no, deep I'll trouble. Wait. Yeah. But uh, they uh, KTM worked with Lit Pro and it's been working on it for years now, developing a uh, ECU with GPS, with lap times, with all this stuff. So now instead of wearing a Lip Pro on your helmet, which you can't do in AMA anymore, like you can't attach stuff to your helmet. Now you gotta, you don't have to attach any Lip Pro. Like if you have a KTM factory edition, it's already in the bike. Um, it's there's like it's on the front fender and it's behind the front number plate, GPS. Sick. So it tracks your lap times. It tracks uh, all that stuff that Lip Pro can do, like doing sections and this and that. And it connects to your ECU so you can mess with your phone just like Yamaha, do the Yamaha Power Tuner app where Yamaha started that years ago where you can adjust the maps and make the bike slower, faster, mellower. And you can monitor engine hours, you know, maintenance hours, like make notes in the app. Yamaha started it. KTM tried to copy it a couple years ago. It failed. And then now they're coming back with a bigger and better operation. And with Lit Pro, they can monitor all these things. But the coolest part isn't the lap times or the engine, the mapping, the coolest part is you can actually measure your RPMs and gear position around the track. So going back to back with uh, Ryan Moraes, like I shifted way less than he did around Glen Helen and we had the same, like similar lap times, but he's revving it more, shifting more, and I'm just like lugging it around. And uh, it's it pretty funny, like, and it's pretty cool to compare. And we, they did a good job of like, hey, this is coming, but like, hey, don't talk about it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And as long as we respect that, then we can keep doing cool stuff, you know? Yeah. And talk yeah. about it when it does come out. And uh, it's a really cool, cool system. But I don't know all the details about it, but that part plus the frame being a little bit softer, a little more flexible. Um, I haven't tested the new engine mounts that they have yet, but like those things are kind of ironing out the problems that you've talked about and that yeah. KTM has had where it's went from a soft and, you know, more comfortable frame to a very stiff frame overnight with one change, you know, yeah. one platform change from one generation to the next. And I think now they're kind of trying to go back to be a little more flexible, a little more yeah. compl uh, compliant around the track. Man, it's, I, I would have thought when I first rode the new frames, I was like, ah, don't know. I think I like the old bike better. Yeah. But then I rode that I probably put like 24 or 25 hours on the XC on the XCF. XC, yeah. yeah. I freaking love that thing now, dude. Mm -hmm. Like really good. And it turns awesome. But I mean, I've done everything to it now. Like yeah. it's got the FCP chassis mounts and the engine bolts. It's got lower foot pegs. It's got Jamie's ECU. It's got a Yoshi pipe. Nice. Um, Which foot pegs did you put on it? The Raptor ones. Oh, sick. So they're, I think they're just five mil down. I, I like running the five mil back. Yeah. But um, they didn't have them. So okay. I, just, I bought them off Motorsport. Nice. Um, and then it's got Track Shock, the AEO, full linkage nice. under the bottom, shower forks, <laughs> extreme. Like it's literally, I, just, up, yeah. I was like, I just, 
did everything. But even before I did all of that, I actually really started liking it. It yeah. turned great. I think one thing that I love on the new KTMs especially is just how tight the ergos are. Mm-hmm. Like, it's funny. I would love – you need to ride my stock. Yeah, I do. I've never ridden one. Because it's the best testing bike ever because you can go – from the stark to a regular bike and notice everything really? straight away and then so like engine braking for example so the husky this year mm-hmm. the stock map is like probably the most engine braking out of the three mm-hmm. austrian bikes mm-hmm. and it's like straight away you can feel it you get because you get off a stark and yeah. onto that so and you can just drag like okay this is a hundred engine brake this is zero and then you can kind of drag in between and then you're like oh that kind of feels a bit like the husky or totally. i wish the husky felt like this yeah so yeah it's kind of changed the game testing wise and that's another thing when it's so narrow there's yep. no radiators yeah and then you get on a husky so wide. and you're like whoa that's yeah. so much wider but then you can compare it to the ktm yeah so it's a crazy cool bike yeah. because the testing feeling that you get and then you can relate it back to a normal bike. No, it's that that is pretty interesting. I was supposed to go to Spain to ride the Stark. Yeah. It was pretty wild. I uh you know, it took a while to get Did you leave before like or did they get you in time? No, they got me in time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like it was it was kind of a fun a quick story. It's not very relevant, but we KTM flew us to Chicago to go to uh Redbud to do mm. their intro for the 23 bikes. So we'd already ridden the new factory edition, but this was like for the 23 bikes and it was so sick to ride Red Bud, p- perfectly prepped track. You know, I'd race the national. Looks so good. It was so sick. But it was just funny because KTM, like I, to fly to Spain, you have to, um, I don't even remember. We had to go through, oh, I did get a COVID test. Oh man, I hate that stuff dude. <laughs> so you had to get a COVID test like within like 48 hours of your flight to Spain, right? Yeah. And uh, and so dumb, but I flew and I'm healthy, I'm not sick, but KTM flies us to Chicago. We have like a day and a half there, you know, and then I'm going to fly from Chicago to Spain to ride the Stark. And there's like a quick layover. Yeah, it was, where did we do a layover? Was it in Chicago? And then we flew to the small airport near Redbud, um, not Buchanan, but like right around there. And uh, we had like an hour or something. And I left the airport, went to the rental car center, took a COVID test, went back into the airport and like just made it for the next flight, the pedal jumper over to Buchanan or whatever airport's right there. And uh, maybe it's South Bend, South Bend, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, but yeah, long story short, I, I sweated it, dude trying to make it happen because I didn't want to leave KTM like they were taking us around but I got the COVID test got back on the airplane and then I was at Chicago for like five or six hours on the way home like everybody else went to Chicago and they were going back to California and I was like okay I'm just gonna stay here and I got a flight to Spain to ride the Stark it's gonna be really cool and then uh and then they called and they're like hey yeah you're the bikes having issues like come back the following week we'll book you a flight like they were super nice and they wanted me to ride the bike when it was having no issues and like all clean you know but then i was racing paula that weekend Mm. and hangtown so like more talking about the prep for paula and hangtown i was spending those weeks you know in in at redbud i was spending at the airport i was in florida the week before that so it was kind of funny but didn't get to ride the stark seen a lot of cool stuff about it and then now um, motocross action we're waiting hopefully to get one someday and then be able to do a long-term test on it and review it and i think it's I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, well, next time I'll, I'll try and take my bike on Tuesday. I, I don't think I have to take bikes out there. I'm trying to get a couple of Yamahas for that yeah, one. Nice. So I'll take it so you can sneak a couple laps. That'd be cool. But, um, yeah, it'd be, I'll be very interested for your opinion on it. Cause it's just like, uh, you've rode Alters and stuff. I've right? rode Alta, I've ridden a couple other yeah. bikes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen a bunch of the e bikes up. This thing's totally different. Yeah. But, yeah, I guess just the feel of, you know, you can hear tires moving. You can just, you can feel so experience. much more when the vibration and the noise is taken out of it. Do you like the rear handbrake? Yeah, so much better. You do, it's, huh? yeah. it's awesome, yeah. Well, I think, especially with no clutch, yeah. like you can kind of use it a little bit. I wish I had it for World Vets. Really? It would have been so much better. How come um, you didn't? Uh, the bike just didn't come with it. Mm. And so I didn't even know that... So I'd said offhand on the podcast a bunch of times, people are like, what what 
bike you're gonna race at world bets and i was like oh, i'm just gonna do it on a stock and it was kind of an offhand comment uh-huh. and they were always like yeah we'll get your bike as soon as we can but i wasn't tripping yeah. i wasn't stressing i'm like whatever i'm yeah. good and then it was the week before the race maybe that's the friday uh before world vets week and then uh, morgan hits me up and he goes hey man i got the stock and can you pick it up it's going to be in escondido or, nice. or carlsbad and i was like i was in florida doing a thing for the lawrence brothers we yeah. did like a red bull shoot then i had to go do the, the gas gas thing so like well while all that was going on my brother and as i got a u-haul went and picked up the stock that's and cool I'll, then it was sitting there and Morgan's like, don't, no pressure if you don't want to race it. And I'd been riding the 350 and I was like, nah, I'd be sick because I don't really care about my results. Yeah. Like I'm not there to win. I'm not going to win. I'm barely going to get top 20. <laughs> but I was like, this would be cool to do. Yeah. And I think everyone everyone was stoked on it. Yeah. Like yeah, people, cool. people were hyped. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, the rear brake would have been better for me. Yeah. Because you just leave your feet in the right spot. Yep. That's there's just the no, part. there's no back and forward. There's no, none of this. You just plant your toes and you leave your feet on so much more in corners. Mm -hmm. You've just got a bit of drag. Like you can kind of just modulate the power a little bit better. Yeah. Um, So for me, I just think it's a game changer. Yeah, honestly. Like most guys don't like the handbrake where the clutch is supposed to be. But uh, have you seen the cake bike? It's like a super exotic Swedish bike. Yeah. I raced that and it had the handbrake and we were racing with Cole Seely and a couple of guys down in Del Mar and, that was super fun and uh you know it had the handbrake so after like, two days of riding it and racing it like i got used to it and now i see the benefits like you leave your feet on the pegs in the exact same spot like you said and it's just so important for like maneuvering the bike and weighting the bike in the corners like i love leave, leaving my feet on the pegs in the corners like ramsey taught me that and had me start doing that in 2015 2016 and then it became cool after that yeah you know? but Eli Tomac and Ken Roxon were doing it already in, you know, 2012, 2013 and blah, blah, blah. But it was like, yeah, leaving your feet on is a big deal. Like it saves so much energy, especially a 30 minute moto at a national, like think about lifting your heavy boot out and then bringing it back, like your hip flexors, your leg muscles, yep. like bringing it all the way out, bringing it all the way back. So if you can just leave it in the same spot and not have to even move it to hit the rear brake or to shift, like it's just locked, like it's like clip-ins on a mountain bike, right? That's what I was about to say. It's kind of in mountain biking, they're literally clipped to the bike. Yeah, and see how much better they can maneuver. It's a lot lighter, but we have all the gyro effect of the engine, you know, uh, that we can use to help maneuver the bike, right? And and by locking it in, having my guts wing seat on there, my legs are just glued to the bike. So, and then I like... Uh, Normally, I like a hefty amount of grip tape as well. I just love that. <laughs> love yeah. free, it's like free money for me. Like, throw the grip tape on. I'm not going to get tired, you know? Well, the, the stock's probably too skinny in the rear. Yeah. So that's one thing. Get when, the steg pegs for it, right? Yeah. Well, there was, I've, I've been trying to – I've got an idea for – I probably shouldn't say it too much on air, but <laughs> I've, I've, like, said to Anton, because they've got every CNC machine. they got every 3D printer. Like, they got everything. Yeah. And I'm telling him I've got an idea for exactly what I want and what I think would work yeah. really well. Because steg pegs are good, but they're too much. I've never tried one, but I just like the idea of more grip. Yeah, they're just, you can get desert ones. Like if you ever try one, do the desert ones. They're mm. extended back a okay. bit. But the stock ones that a normal person, like the normal steg pegs, they're too, yeah. because we ride on our toes with our legs back. Yeah. And it's just in the way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I've got an idea for some stuff that I think would be like really good that you could actually still move you're not so locked in i like it but man even like holding up on the gear shifter like that's huge mm-hmm. like i started doing that up the hills at glen helen like where i'd shift and just hold it and like try and get my weight back yeah but um yeah the, the stock's probably a little bit too skinny i reckon mm, yeah i mean but I you'd rather make it it's easy to make it wider yeah wider than skinnier right? yeah so it's better to start there yeah no i think it's interesting but i i do got to be honest with you i was in the middle of the track taking photos and videos while you're riding at world vet taking a couple shots of you and the rest of the guys it's hard to realize like how hard you're riding when you're on the stark like i watched you on the ktm i know you're charging you're revving you're this or that you know like oh he's being smooth right now he's just lugging it through this section but when i just hear your chain slap <laughs> you know going through the section like it's hard to hard to know like is he trying right now is he not trying right now is he going fast i don't know and it, 
it's kind of like even my brother growing up, he was so smooth on a 65 and he just rode it like a sewing machine around the track. He's like, me, me. And nobody knew he was fast even until, and really until like you get to the race and you're like, oh dang, he's fast, you <laughs> he's know? Ripping. Yeah, or you do a lap time, but he's just so like lugging it around the track. And that's kind of the same thing. Like you can't really tell with an e-bike, like if they're going fast or not. Stark is doing a great job of making videos of all their bikes. Like you go on their Instagram and like, it looks super cool. So with the right video and stuff, you can make it look really cool. And, but it's, it is hard the sound. To, you don't get the feedback from yeah. the sound for sure. Even when I rode the Alta, like we filmed it. And I, when I rode it, I was like, dude, I got to buy one of these. Like this thing is so sick and I want to, I want an e-bike now. But then I watched the videos afterwards and I was like, oh man, like it doesn't even look cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I gotta be honest, like I, I'm excited to ride the Stark. I gotta, I'm excited to ride any e-bike that comes out in the future. But like, it's, it's hard to, for me right now in the spot that I'm in, maybe because I haven't ridden it yet to see that it would be like super, super cool. But there are super, lots of benefits to the e-bikes of riding in cooler places. Like I, I want to put a super crash track and, you know, downtown, wherever, and yeah. like exposed to where you're not worried about sound anymore. And I think those kinds of things will be really cool. Like Eric Pinard yeah. doing the E Adventure, E Explorer yeah. series. Yeah. I think it's cool. Maybe not, maybe it's not taken off yet, but uh, it's a cool idea. Yeah. Well, it has to happen now. Like you've got to start, start the, the devil. Yeah. And even what I was saying to Anton from Stark after World Vets, I was like, it's just crazy that that's product one. Yeah. And a, I could get it a week before the race and go and race. Yeah, honestly, and, yeah. And do better. I think I would done better than what I would have done on a, on a different bike. Yeah, that's the hard part. Like I... I'm I'm on both sides of the fence, and as a media guy, I can I feel like I can do yeah, that. Yeah, like, you're supposed to stay where you are. I'm supposed like, to stay yeah. in the middle, you yeah. know. Like, uh, I don't have a huge opinion. Like, e-bikes are gonna are the worst thing in the world, and I don't have a huge opinion. Like, I love e-bikes, you know. Right now, I'm skeptical, but I also haven't ridden it yet, so yeah. Um, I think they're super fun to ride and not as fun to watch, but maybe by the time they're in Supercross, we gotta figure a way to compensate for that you know i don't know how it's going to be but they even bring up the point like football stadiums they have music they have all, like the football players are just running and oh you know <laughs> yeah like, there's, that, no, sound there's there. no cool sounds but yeah. people love to watch it so yeah. there's got to be there's got to be a way yeah now i'll try and bring it tuesday for you to ride nice um so should we talk about 450s for this year because we've both rode all of them yeah what, yeah totally what what was your pick did you pick the cowie yamaha you did pick the Yamaha. Yeah. yeah, I actually picked the Yamaha as well. Really? Or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yamaha is a good bike. It's a really good bike. It's not perfect. It's like we try to say that. And like we're working on our 450 shootout video right now, and it'll be out by the time this is out. Um, I think we're gonna post it on Monday. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, four the Yamaha won last year. It wins again this year for us. KTM was second, and oh, KTM second this year. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, but the Yamaha is like, it does everything well. It's, if you loved Yamaha in 22 and prior, you might not like this one because it changed so much, right? But if you didn't like Yamaha before, you're probably going to like this one now. <laughs> That's it, such a good way to say it. You know what I mean? Like, so it's almost like the KTM, you know, a lot of guys that liked KTMs when they went to 2023, they were like, oh, it's too stiff. It's too this, too that. Almost similar for Yamaha. It got way lighter. It got way more nimble, way uh, just easier to corner, you know, not as balanced and not as balanced, but also not as uh, stable, like straight line stability. You do get a little more head shake now. So there's things that you got to work compensate, through, compensate yeah. for. Yeah. But if I want a whole shot, I, I, and I have to, I look at Jody's barn and our, our barn of MXA and go to pick from all the bikes. It's like, who am I racing this weekend? <laughs> do I want a whole shot? Do I really need a whole shot? Okay. I'm picking the Yamaha, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've raced that thing quite a few times. Stock, raced it with good KYB suspension. Um, so, yeah, I like the Yamaha. I, that was my first. So I rode the Yamaha. I rode Brad West's nice. Yamaha. I think it was the 23 model. Yep. Um, so it was a new shape, but it had like pipe, ignition, fucking race gas. like suspension. Gnarly. It just wasn't cool. <laughs> and I did not like how it handled at all. Really? And I was like, okay, that's a bit of a box of shit. I'll... <laughs> stick to my ktms <laughs> yeah and uh and then i rode i always loved the 250f yamaha yeah and i rode your old one confirmed loved yeah. it like there that old the the gen before 
Mm-hmm. That Yamaha is like a huge wooden ship. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, Point that ship and go. Yeah. Just go. And whatever's in your way, like the suspension's amazing. Yeah. Like I remember when I was doing the day riding with you guys and I was coming basically directly back to our pits, that sand mm-hmm. that used to get gnarly bumps there. Yeah. And I remember there was one lap and I was feeling myself and I was fucking coming out and I looked at this bump and I went, fuck <laughs> that i don't have the suspension to hit that and i literally thought my hands were going to blow off the bars and it was completely fine really and i was like dude Isn't this that cool? is crazy good yeah. suspension and that's and i was coming off that's just coming directly off ktm yeah and like hitting that bump and i was like oi and yeah. then it was sweet nice but then the new version it lost a bit of that feeling mm. so but it it just feels different and mm-hmm. i guess you'd have to like more time whatever you, you, yeah. you get used to bikes but i rode the 2024 yamaha in swap shootout kahir creek i don't really like that track i like the track i don't ride it very good yeah but man i couldn't believe how good that bike was felt way different i didn't have any of the twitchiness that i felt on brad's bike nice it's just the way that it was yeah um but i could not believe how good the motor was yeah and i've you know, said so much 450s are too fast or too fast too fast that bike is just sick yeah. like it's like a you know when you hit like r1 it's just when? yeah like it's just got like it's alive it's a real motor the yamaha is like that and yeah. they, that's exactly what the yamaha 450 is like yeah. you just hit the throttle and like oh this yeah. is this has got some go for sure for and sure. it was really fun and then the yamaha guys were there they put it in a different map and then even so you go on some brands, you go from the aggressive map to the mellow map mm. and it feels like a different bike. Yeah. It just completely changes it. And you're like, ah, well, that, that part was good, but it's just probably a bit too gnarly. Yeah. The Yamaha, even in the slower map, still gnarly. doesn't feel slow, yeah. but it kind of takes away what you'd want it to take away. So I was completely blown away by that engine in a stock motorcycle. Yeah. And I ended up, I really like the Cowie mm-hmm. as well, yep. and I really like the KTM. But I was, I was thinking, okay, you've probably got a massive KTM bias here, mm-hmm. just because you're so comfortable on KTM. Yeah. Um, but then Swap was basically like, all right, if you had fifteen grand right now to buy a bike, and you walked into a dealership, what would it be? And I said the Yamaha. Nice. Because I was like, you that's know so what? funny. Because you're a three fifty guy, and that's the gnarliest four fifty yeah. to buy, dude. Yeah. But I just was like, if it was my money. Yeah. And I'm just doing this to have fun. Yeah. Then that's probably the bike yeah. that I would go and buy. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, it's like uh, it is a it is a beast of a bike, and you ha- and th- so we just dynoed them all um, for our shootout. The Husky actually downed the most, which is crazy. Because it feels pretty slow. 61 horsepower. KTM 59.9 something. I can't remember. Like right at 60. Yamaha 58. Really? Can you believe it? No. Yeah. I think I'm I'm spitballing. So check our shootout, you know, for the, for yeah. the real numbers. But I think it was Cowie was 57. Yeah. Low 57, maybe high 56. But uh but yeah, Yamaha, you know, it feels like the fastest bike on the track because as soon it's as you, the way it revs. It's just rot, yeah. like gnarly off the bottom, yeah. yeah. And so you have to detune that to really ride the bike well. And then like even we put FM, we're doing like, we've been working on a, a drawn out five pipe shootout I for heard, Yamaha. I've heard you talk about it before. Oh, it's embarrassing because <laughs> because it's my fault, all of it. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, we did like a cool, dyno, a t- cool day with Yamaha, tested them all. And then we dynoed them all. And then we decided we wanted to add another pipe in there. So then we're like, well, we need to redo everything. So now it's taken months and months. And like, we have so much stuff that has to get done and we have some stuff that yeah. should get done. Yeah. And this has fallen in the category of like, needs to get done, but hasn't gotten done. And it's all my fault. But all those pipes detune that initial hit to make it a little easier to ride. They add power overall, but they make it easier to ride. So hmm. it's like Yamaha, you felt it. It's like, it's crazy fast. Why would I want any any more horsepower? But the cool part about FMF, Pro Circuit, uh, Yoshimura, like DRD, like there are all these companies that are able to tune the power to make it better, but also easier to ride. And that's like one revelation I've had. Um, the KX450SR. So the, the KX450 has always been slow and it's been like, 
I should know the numbers off the top of my head. It's based in, I think it's like 55, 54, 56, like right in there. Which is like a good 350. Yeah. My 350 in Oz has 55 horsepower. Yeah. So Cowie's not far above the 350. More torque, so it feels totally different. But it's uh, it's always been slow. But then they made the KX450 SR the last two years, and it's four horsepower faster. But it's, it's rideable. It's easier to ride almost than the stock one because of the way Pro Circuit massaged the, the exhaust. It's pro, because of the way that Kawasaki massaged the ports, the intake exhaust ports. All those, those two combinations plus the ECU just make it easier to ride. And it doesn't feel like, it feels faster because you're going yeah. faster, but it doesn't feel like it's going to rip out of your arms. Yeah. So it's just funny how that works where people talk about you don't need a 450 to be too fast, but like everybody needs a, b- a fast bike for the start, especially Glen Helen where it's so long. Yeah. But then you got to find a bike that you can ride around the track. And the Yamaha is like gnarly fast, but it, it's not even the mo- like, it feels like the fastest bike. Yeah. But it doesn't have the most horsepower. Yeah. And then those, those pipes you put on there can massage it to make it easier to ride, but actually improve power. But going back to your topic of three fifties are better. And like, we need to go back to two fifties. Like I did a, we were like at Glen Helen and I do a weekly video this week in MXA, me and Trevor every week. And we're like, man, what are we going to do this week? And it's like, well, we got three brand new bikes right here. Let's just do a shootout like for this video, just to be funny. I'll do lap times. So 450, 350, 250, gas, gas, bone stock, stock tire, stock suspension, stock everything. Set the sag for me. It's the end of the day. It's like 105 degrees outside. We've been shooting other videos up until this point, but we need to film this this week in MXA because shoot, we're contracted to do it every week. So, um, so we get on the 450. I like tuck the front on the coming down the hill on the first lap, trying to do a lap time like, at the bottom of the hill. Like that's gnarly. Crash pretty hard. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's not a good dude, place. To no, it was horrible. And get it back up. All right, go back, do another lap time. Get the 450 lap time. Get the 350 lap time. Get the 250 lap time. They got faster each time, and I was the fastest on the 250. So it's just it's funny how that works. Um, but I would never win a race on the 250. Like, and I because even, you couldn't get the start. Yeah, I even wanted to race the 250 this year at World Vet because I'm 27, 25 plus class is not a cool class to race at World Vet. I only do it because I just want to go hang out with everybody. But the 30 plus, 30 plus pro, that's like where they pay you, and that's where yeah. people actually care about it. So I just did the 25 plus as like a support class. And I was like, I should race the Yamaha 250, get to know it a little bit better. We're working on some mods with Jamie and with uh, with Brandon at AHM suspension. But then I was like, at the last minute, I was like, I don't want to get ruined on the start and yeah. like lose, <laughs> yeah. lose a race or this or that. So I was like, I'm going to ride the Yamaha 450. So I just raced it bone stock and call it good. But that's the the debate is always like, you kind of go back and forth like, well, I was faster lap time on a 250 and yeah. I could probably ride it harder for longer, but you need a star. But if somebody's behind you, they can just rip past you up the hill. Like it's it's a constant debate, but it's fun. And yeah. as a test rider, like I get to ride a lot of cool bikes and you get to keep asking that question. And same with you, you get to ride quite a few bikes. So anytime you're at Glen Helen, you can ride our bikes. So it works <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, the, that bike and... The KTM 450 has an amazing motor this year too. Yeah. Like, dude, it was good. Yep. And I'll, I'll ask you if you think this. So I always like to confirm my testing feelings because mm-hmm. I'm not that fast, <laughs> but I always pay like a lot of attention. You to don't have bike. to be fast to be a tester. Did you think that the KTM stock is easier to ride in third gear than the Yamaha, even though the Yamaha feels like it has more power? I was in second gear and shifting to third mm. on the Yamaha, whereas the KTM, I could just keep it in third. Yeah, I would, agree. Like I would agree with that, yeah. Because it feels like it's almost counterintuitive thinking, okay, the Yamaha's got like crazy, all this crazy, crazy power, torque. yeah, but you're not riding that in third gear. Like second gear feels so good and it feels like it goes forever, mm-hmm. but you, to go second, third feels so good on the yamaha yeah and i would say i like even on my 350 i'm third gear most corners i try and set my bike up to ride so that i just ride third gear basically every third fourth and fifth down the start straight at Glen helen and Mm -hmm. then that's it but the yamaha i was like dude i actually really like second gear on this bike it's funny and then it 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 can rip the hole straight if you need it to, or you just shift into third but i just found it such a crazy style of engine and it's not even that it 
it feels the fastest, which, and you said it's not, but it's the way that it makes power. Yeah. And then it's got like, it's almost has, if you ride Ducatis, if you ever ride like Ducati road bikes and mm-hmm. stuff, there's just a way, because they've got that Desmo Sedici valve system. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a way that the valves just fit, it revs free. It feels like it floats in the, in like the mid and up section of the power. Yeah. I would agree. The Yamaha's unique power. Um, and talking about that second to third gear transition, like our our slang for MXA is race test. So like every article is like race test. Every video we talk about racing the bikes because we race them every Saturday at Glen Helen, like you mentioned. And so through racing, we're able to test. And that was one thing I didn't figure out until I started racing. Mm. It was like second gear can go for a long ways on that thing, dude. It is nice. Uh, racing that bike, like we pick it up, we do our photo shoot while the bike's brand new, we start testing it. We do, you know, initial reports on how it is, but then we're continuing to test it, multiple guys, but then it's like races this weekend, I'll take the newest bike. I'll take the bike we got to learn the most, you know? So I take the Yamaha 450 that weekend and I was racing with Parker Ross yeah, and he's a good- Rips. Yeah, Rips SLR Honda. And he's probably faster now than when I raced with him a year ago, but uh, he's from Northern California too. And he's got Epic style and trains with uh, Ryan Hughes. And um, so we were- racing together at a mammoth qualifier i think it was and track was pretty good and uh yeah i could i i was getting tired because of stock suspension but i was leading whole shot for sure on the yamaha right um leading and then i was getting tired and like i don't want to shift into third i'm just gonna leave it in second and dude it just keeps going and keeps going and it's like oh that is nice you know and then uh, a couple a couple weeks after that it rained a lot and Glen Helen was like better than it's been in a long time. It changed the track because of the rain. It was like too mudded out to ride some spots. So we were riding through some sandy areas. Track was rough. People were there a long time. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon. And I have the My Pit Board lap time. Yep. On your, they're good, eh? It's really nice. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah. Shout out to those guys. I do a good job. Dude, I need another one. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Mine's all scratched up, but uh, from just being in the van too long. But yeah, I was on my, I, I used that to get lap times and I'm going back and forth Yamaha and KTM last year before our shootout. And I'm like trying to decide, I raced the Yamaha, I liked it, you know, a little twitchy, a couple things I need to figure out, but then back and forth doing lap times that day and uh, just keep moving the pit board over, you know, the bikes both set up for me sag wise and moving that handlebar pad over and I would go on the Yamaha and I'd be like, oh, I felt a little sketchy, but I had this lap time. And then I go on the KTM, like, man, that was a sick lap, a second slower. And then I go back on the Yamaha, like, and I do two or three laps at a time. And the track's gnarly and like, I'm getting more and more tired, but I just keep going. The lap times were getting better. And like the Yamaha continued, I'm like, I'm just going to slow down and ride more consistent and like try not to feel sketchy on the Yamaha because I was like worried about the front end. And then times kept getting better and better and better. And I ride the KTM I'm like, man, that was a sick lap. Look down at the, at the lap. Like you can look down while you're riding. Yeah, right? yeah. You look down and it's like a oh, red slower than the, slower than before, you know, and it's green whenever it's faster. So slower, slower. So that was my 23 versus 23 KTM versus Yamaha. And that's why I chose the Yamaha. Like, yeah, it's not perfect. I don't feel amazing on it all the time. Um, I might even feel more consistent on the KTM that day, especially and other days, probably too. But once I, you know, Luxon triple clamps, do some different offset, 20, 23 mils, what I like, yep. like I raise the handlebars up, I stiffen the forks up, then it's like, okay, yeah, this bike should win. Even though I feel maybe cooler on the KTM or a little more consistent, like it just continued to point, all systems pointed to the Yamaha. Yeah. And the second gear, being able to rev that longer was, yeah, it's like free money. Yeah. No, it's cool to, it's cool to hear. And that I think, that, again, that's what makes the way you guys test so good is like... <laughs> You go to the same place, same days. Yeah. All the bikes are there. Like you've got people there that, are, you know, the day that I was there when you guys were testing Luxon. Yeah. Dude, that was a hectic day. That was, kind that was of a busy day. A kind of fun day to, to have you at the track, dude. And yeah. I couldn't even, I was like so bummed I couldn't hang with you more. Cause I'm like, hey, Jace, like, you know, we met, but we're kind of, <laughs> kind of meeting again. Yeah. And like, hey, dude, you want to ride? Like I have my buddy, Josh Holly, who uh, helps us with a bunch of stuff. He was riding with you and, and uh, so you guys were doing 250 stuff because I was working on our, 
I think I was. You were doing the Luxon clamps that day. I'm yeah, sure. I was working with Billy from Luxon on yeah. on the Yamaha 450, and then we had Josh Fout and uh, Sean Bushnell were working on some Nitro Moose that they were working on like some prototype stuff. That's, that's pretty right. cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had three different projects going at once, and that's kind of you know the job of being an MXA test rider, and you know me now managing editor for us is you're juggling a lot of things at once. You're doing cool stuff, but it's also hectic and busy and it just, it's, it's all part of it. Like Josh Valley mentioned, like he was by mechanic at the nationals I did. That's right. Yeah. And then he, he just, he doesn't get paid one penny from us. I pay him in boots and gear and helmets and bikes. And he drives down the hill and like helps us out. And, uh, he lives up in big bear. Oh, sick. Yeah. So, um, so he's a huge help. His dad, Randall is a huge help. And, um, but yeah, he, He's a big part of it. Brian Medeiros as well does suspension and tests for us. So it's like a, it's a big family of guys that we all work together and yeah. and produce a magazine every month, produce a website, the Instagram, the YouTube, the whole It is machine. crazy how much you guys can put out. It's a lot. It's definitely a lot. But it's, uh, it's, it's a passion project. And I think like part of it, like for me, I have to tell myself to not work so much sometimes mm. because like- Well, you like everything that you're doing. You like, yeah, you like it. And so it's more just managing, like knowing where to spend time, what not to spend time on, how to say no to certain projects. <laughs> We're talking about that. Yeah, because yeah. like there's always opportunities that come in this position to go do cool things, but is that going to take away from other things that are more important? So it's, yeah, it's- it's an adventure. No, I feel you on that. Yeah. Uh, New Cowie was good. I liked it. Yeah. I, th- I feel like I when I rode that, I thought, yeah, the motor definitely was like uninspiring. It's probably the best way to say it. When, and it's like rev slow in the same way that you'd say that yeah, Yamaha, just the way it revs, like the way that it feels, the Cowie's literally the exact opposite. Yeah. But everything else was sick. Yeah. And I feel like, that bike could easily be woken up. Pipe, ignition, some whatever work that you got to do to it, yep. then that thing is going to come alive for you. Yep. But loved how it handled. Uh, I really, it's funny, I split bikes now ergonomics into front half and back half. Yeah. So like the back half ergonomics are so sick on that bike. Mm-hmm. You've got so much contact yep. with the the side panels and the yep. numbers. Yep. That feels epic. And then it's like quite skinny at the front as well. Yep. That new Brembo worked awesome. Love that. Felt like a KTM coming down the hill, Just right? Love that feeling. Yeah. yeah. So I love that that bike. Um, and the only reason I wouldn't have picked, like if that had a Yamaha motor in it, mm-hmm. you'd be pretty, pick it pretty quick. I would for sure. For um, sure. So yeah, what what were your thoughts on it? Same same as you, basically uninspired by the engine. Like I rode the twenty three the day before, rode the twenty four. I was like, man, it felt like it was slower. Honestly, it wasn't. It's about the same or a tiny bit better, but it has less the least amount of torque out of any engine in the class right now. I know that from the dyno as well. Like, so that ha- having a little less torque, like a little less exciting. Um, but you know, we're hard on it because it's slower than it was before. And there's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Like I already mentioned it, you know, yeah, it's slower. So average rider could ride it better, ride it easier, you know, make less mistakes, probably ride it longer. But I already said like the the 450 SR was four horsepower faster and it was better and you could still, still ride it. So that the the arguments kind of fight against each other with like slower, better sometimes. But, uh, but the KX 450 is honestly like Dennis Stapleton, he says it's the best kind of dummy bike i guess like yeah. anybody could pick it run it you don't have air forks to check the air pressure in like you don't have a lot of brake. like ktm you need to break in the bike you need to break in the chassis at Dude, least the old chassis the the one that i rode the when we did the shootout it had two hours on it right yeah and so the husky had 12 and a half and that's the one my buddy raced at world vets yeah so i got i rode the husky first and then i got on the ktm and I instantly looked at the hour meter. As soon as I got on the track, I was like, I was like, this thing's brand new. The, the uh, Husky was or the KTM? No, the KTM. Oh, yeah. Two hours. Mm. The difference on handling of those motorcycles that Crazy, huh? 10 hours makes yep. is mental. And yep. I think that that's probably 
like to go back to what we were saying before about, you know, everyone was saying about the new chassis yeah. with KTM. I think it just takes a really long time. Yeah. Like the average guy to put 12 hours on a motorcycle, yeah. that bike's going to feel like shit for ages. Yeah, yeah. Dude, honestly, that's the hardest part, but you need 10 hours. That's what we say. Like KTM, don't throw the forks away. Don't throw the engine. Like don't sell the bike until you get 10 hours on it because yeah, it's going to change. But at the same time, that's a knock. And that's another reason why it didn't win our shootout yeah, this year, you know, 23, 24, it's just like, you can't, nobody wants to spend 12 grand on a bike. That's like a third of your year yeah. is running your bike in. For some people, yeah. Like for mo, I mean, dude, for me, before I started doing the podcast and like back when I was riding, 40 hours for me on a bike is a lot yeah. of hours. So you're asking for a quarter of the time on your bike for it to suck. Yeah, that's not so cool. So it's just a – but, I mean, yeah, nowadays you just – if you got them and you're a racer and you're serious about it, you just let, don't do anything yeah, break until it 10 hours and yeah. that's like a good excuse to put 10 hours on a bike. So there's like yeah, yeah. positives there as well, just the type of rider that you are. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh but yeah, the Cowie, I reckon I'd love to spend more time on and I'd love to like fire it up a bit. And it's cool to, it's cool to you know, start, there's two ways you could look at it. Oh, do I want to spend more money on my bike or whatever? But let's face it, everyone does. Yeah. Like who, who, who buys a bike and yeah. just fully leaves a stock forever? Some people, but not too many. Yeah, not yeah I, too, get, I get it. I get not it. too many. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's like there's a lot of room to yeah. improve it. You yeah. Know? And it's, int- it's actually cool to hear you say that the pipe, on the Yamahas actually makes it easier. Which is counterintuitive, Very. which is why I need to finish that shootout. Yeah. <laughs> so people that's, can know that. You that's know? good to learn though, because yeah. I would have thought uh, if I get a Yamaha 450, I'm not going to put a pipe on it. No way. Like, I'll just keep it how it is. Twin air power flow kit. You know those? Yeah, yeah. Put that on the Yamaha. You, th- you think, I wouldn't want that. It makes it louder, makes it faster. It's already too fast. We put it on. Uh, like our, our Randall Fout was our test rider for it. We put it on and he's like, man, I don't want more power to this thing, you know? put it on it smoothened it out more like yeah. so we're doing little things and it's just funny like as a test rider it's uh black and white like it's not always black and white like sometimes yeah. white is black you know yeah. and and so you you have to go off of the feel of the rider not always the dyno not always what you know counter uh you know you just have to go off of what it feels like and the twinner yeah. power flow kit on the yamaha did the same thing like actually kind of detuned a little bit and then made it easier to ride better overall yeah um it's funny how that works That's super interesting have you tried the ktms with that um yeah yeah we, i mean their power flow kit i'm trying to think on the ktms i think it's just a it's just an air box air uh air filter cage yeah with yeah, no with yeah. no screen on it so yeah, yeah it's it's good it's really good it's what i raced with when i raced and what i race with now um but it didn't change like the Didn't air filter system, it, yeah, because it's already yeah. KTM already has a twin air filter stock. It's already good, but the Yamaha twenty three, like it's easy to get dirt. Uh, it's easy for the Yamaha to suck dirt into the intake. So the twin air power flow kit, you know, increased air filter, but also has a bracket on the front that helps you keep the the dirt out. the dirt that keeps the filter sucked down to the air box better, so the dirt's not flying in there as easily. Um, so the tw- Yamaha air filter setup is. You know, it's easy to change. It's nice that way, but it's also difficult sometimes. But that power flow kit was kind of a band aid for that, keeping dirt out, but also helping power and changing the power a little bit. And that was what we felt on the track. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. So you run the 23 mil offset. Yeah. Which is, is that in between? Uh, it's 22 is stock. So yeah. just bringing it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, stabilizing the bike a little bit. And that's what Luxon, they have their Gen 3 Pro clamp. Have you tried that? No, nah, not yet. So it you can mess with the I've offset. got that clamp on my KTM KTM back home because okay. I got the MX Tech forks in it. Yeah. And I I loved it. They, like they look sick. Yeah. Yeah. So we just with that you can with the pro version you can change the offset and you know, move it so from twenty one was like somebody could run in supercross. I think Jeremy Martin I don't know if he ran it or not, but the Club MX Yamaha team runs it in Supercross. At 21 would be sharper turning, this or that. 22 stock, 23, 24 is what you have. And I actually raced Paula National on 24. That's what I remember you saying. Yeah, but then after more testing, because I didn't have much testing before Paula, just kind of whip it together and go race. Uh, 23 was actually better that day I was with you. And then I like a little bit taller handlebars that day as well. Yeah. So. It's interesting. Have you messed with the swing arm at all on them? No. Everybody puts 
or some people put the old Yamaha swing arm, but I haven't gone to the, li- I like, I had a, some guy say he could, he would let me try it. But uh, for me, it's like most people aren't going to go buy a swing arm for their new <laughs> bike, you know? Yeah. So for, there's not a whole lot of purpose in me Just testing Just be it. testing for testing sake. Just, kind of it'd be testing for fun yep. and be interesting, but it wasn't practical and it wasn't like, yeah, it wasn't something I had to do. Have you tried the Yamaha with like a show of steering dampener or a WP steering dampener? Not yet, but WP... Uh, Mark Johnson from REP Suspension. He just Shout out. he just did one for our KTM 450, and Josh Fout loves it. And he's like, you know, didn't think that he needed a stabilizer on the KTM. Dude, I love it, man. Yeah, they feel so much better, dude. Honestly, need to put one on the Yamaha. Like, I don't have any races in the near future planned. So, like, sometimes what I'm testing is based on like what needs to get done and like yeah. what events are coming yeah. up and stuff, but that is one that I think the Yamaha would definitely benefit from. We're also the hydro clutch. We're trying to ride that soon. So I've been trying to get some things from Yamaha, trying to get them to help us with that. And with another 250 test with air boxes, um, stuff that we're doing with Jamie Ellis. So, uh, yeah, Jamie's a wizard as well. And he's got lots of tricks up his sleeve. So we're, yeah, having fun, having fun testing it all. That's and sometimes awesome. like with this job, it's, it's like the reality of like, there's always cool stuff to do. There's always more stuff to do, but it's more so just trying to keep up and, and get all the regular stuff done and keep up you know, with all the fun stuff too. Oh man, it feels the same. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool though. Can't complain. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what else we, so that we sort of talked about the KTMs. I feel like the, the KTM group did a really good job. Like they're basically trying to make three different motorcycles. Yeah. It's the same platform, but it's it's kind of like in cars, right? Yeah. Like you'll have a Lexus, that make like yeah, the yeah. chassis and then it's like, okay, this is kind of this look and yep. this vibe and then you got this for this. I feel like that's what Austria is doing with the KTM. Yeah. Like or with the those bikes. KTM is like super fast. Like that's the ready to race bike. Yep. And that's pretty much how it feels. It feels like it's got the best motor. Yeah. Uh, it feels, I don't know, like I, I love the ergos, like the front. I yep. guess like the front ergos. The Husky has better rear ergos, I would mm-hmm. say, like yep. better contact. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you've got that bike. The Husky is if you're shorter, like that it's literally just a bike made for if you're a smaller dude. Yeah. I feel like the it turns way tighter. Mm-hmm. Um if you're I would say if you're like the if you like to sit down and you're shorter, then get a husky mm-hmm. if you want a KTM group yeah. bike, basically. Yeah. And then the gas gas is kind of right in the middle. Mm-hmm. Like it feels more like the KTM, but the bars are softer, the clamps are softer, the wheels are softer. Like it feels like a KTM that you don't have to run in, yeah. essentially. Yeah, for sure. So I think that they, and the gas gas would be my idiot's 450. So like for if sure. you wanted to just buy a 450, don't do anything to it. You want it easy to ride. You're just the average dude that's going to go weekend warrior. Yeah. Gas gas is probably the one. Yeah. The only knock on it we gave it is like the price, unfortunately. Like when they first came out with it, it was just right at Yamaha, Kawi, Honda. Now it's jumped up to 10400 bucks. So it's like more expensive than, the, it's the same as the new Kawi, which is all new and yeah. raised the price much more than the Honda, more than the Yamaha. Um, much more than Suzuki. So, so yeah, like I'm with you there, but it is a bummer. Like they put brake tech components on it now, brake tech clutch and brakes. Mm. And so the clutch isn't as strong, like just the actuation, the internals are all the same as KTM, but just the, the initial pull of it. And then the brakes aren't the same either. Uh, so it's a little bit of a bummer that they like, you know, they have these price point products on there, but then they still pretty expensive, still a little less expensive than KTM's, 11 one or something like that but yeah but you think like to be they built it to be the entry level bike but it doesn't match the entry level prices of the other 450s basically that makes sense yeah and when we were in when we were in austria at ktm we're like begging i'm like why wouldn't you guys just keep producing old gas gases you know what i mean like that's what i think would be cool it would be super cool but it doesn't make sense like they have an assembly line yeah they have you know frames being made and painted they have all this stuff that's being made it would be more expensive for them to continue producing old bikes and just continue to knock out those old bikes and keep inventory and keep producing that rather than like put everybody on the same frame same swing arm same general 
idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we bagged them, but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Because the old chassis, that's what blows me away. You've got to change and you've yeah. got to move forward and you've got to evolve. But yeah, yeah the whole chassis was so sick. Yeah. So many people liked it. It was, I feel like they pretty much killed it. And then it's like, all right, sweet, two years up, let's go. Next, yeah. whether it's better or not. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was interesting. I was bummed the first day I rode the factory edition. It's like, dude, the KTM made their bikes worse. Really? That's what I felt the first day I rode them. And a lot of people still have that taste in their mouth. I think now, once we know that we got to like break, break, in, the, in. break yeah. in the frame, yeah. And then there are a few parts you could put on it to make it a little bit softer, a little bit better. But honestly, like... Yeah, I was. I said that the first day, and then for a year we had gas, gas on the old platform because what twenty, yeah, twenty three was twenty three gas, gas was still yeah. the old one. Yeah, yeah, which I was proud. I was stoked for my brother because he was riding gas, gas in not you know, yeah, uh, Rockstar yeah. and KTM were struggling with the old chassis, and my brother had the pr- tried and true, the easy one that everybody knew. You didn't have to change anything. It was good. And, you know, he went on to win a San Diego Supercross. He was on the podium a bunch of times, won the first mode at Hangtown. And, like, so he was killing it on that chassis. And I was, like, so stoked for him. And, like, yeah. he had no idea. Like, he knew that he was, like, had an upper hand, like, Gas Gas, Barsha and him were running the old chassis. So it was better for him than Cooper and the rest of the guys struggling with the new chassis. But, but yeah, I, every time I, I could, I was like, dude, you're so, I'm so stoked you're on the old chassis. But now getting used to the new chassis, it's like, I'm pretty well used to it. All of our guys are like, we understand the pros and cons. We know how to work through it. We know you need 10 hours on the frame. We know like sometimes we get air forks that are good right away. Sometimes the air forks are stiff for a couple hours and like you got to break in all the seals on those. And that was even on the previous frame. Yeah. Like we would get a, a bike that would just be like crazy stiff forks and you just got to break it in. Yeah. And it's just funny how bikes vary as well. Like, like Pro Circuit, every factory team, they have all these engines that they build and then they dyno all of them. Uh, we tested Landon Gordon Super Mini, his, his Pro Circuit oh, yeah, Kawasaki yeah, yeah, Super Mini, yeah. the one he won Loretta's on. Yeah. We just posted that video. Even for him, Pro Circuit would build them all these engines. They dyno them all and the best dyno bike, or the bike, best bike on the dyno that engine got saved for the most important races and that was your race bike. So it's the same thing for stock bikes. Stock bikes. Like I told you the kit. Oh, I got to just wait. I got to switch that. No worries. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, just that one card got full so I got to switch her over. We're back on. Nice. <laughs> um yeah, so like so they uh they dyno all the bikes. They save the best one. And my, I told you the Husky got 61 horsepower. Yeah. It's crazy for a stock bike to hit over 60 horsepower. Um, and that's like a horse and a half more than it was. And it's the same engine as KTM, same engine as, as Gas Gas. But that one just dynoed better. Maybe it was more broken. Maybe it just something happened, you know, on the assembly line that that one was a little bit better. So there is those variabilities that you have to like work through sometimes when you're testing. And, and the biggest thing about being a test rider and like, for me, the benefit I have and like why I tell people, you know, you should respect or listen to what we have to say about bikes is like, we ride them all stock and we know what each one's like the base level. And then you can make changes and mess with them and see how it does. But I have lots of buddies who are like, well, yeah, I rode a Yamaha here and I rode a Honda here. Well, and I rode a KTM there and I like the Honda the best, you know, it's like, well, who, what was, who was it built for? Like, what was the SAG set for? I didn't check the SAG. Oh, what track were you riding? Well, I was riding, you know, Cahia in the morning and it was smooth. Well, where did you ride the KTM? Well, it was Glen Helen. It was rough, you know? So there's so many variables which is why we use, like I said, Glen Helen a lot. It just, it just makes the most sense to like stick with the same spot and and take away those variables because, yeah, one day the bike could feel great, oh, the next sure. day it doesn't. You know, it's, yeah, it's funny how it works. Uh, so what are your what are your improvements that you put on the KTM new chassis? Like, what's your recommendations for people? Pro Circuit makes a linkage that. Uh, flips the linkage ratio so like KTM's more ready to race and compared to the other manufacturers and I don't know exactly the linkage curve for each one off the top of my head but Pro Circuit and Luke Luke Boyk over there he uh, he's a G in your, in your language and uh, and so he he developed it and 
it basically flips the curve. So like KTM stock is kind of stiff on top and then gets softer as it goes through, which is better for a pro rider. Like they land, um, land harder off jumps. They're hitting bigger bumps harder, but you're also not casing jumps as much. You're not overshooting jumps. Yeah, so like yep. KTM is the ready to race brand, right? And that's what they, they, they don't tailor to XR 50s, XR 100s. Like they're more tailored towards racing. So that linkage kind of follows that. Like, the linkage is more set up to a racer, more set up even to a guy riding in softer dirt and stuff like that. So let's say Eli Tomac, or maybe not him, but let's say another top pro, they're going to clear the jumps. They're not going to case it. They're not going to overshoot it. They're not going to have any, not going to have as many crazy, like, oh boy moments, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can make it kind of stiff on top and then soft as it goes through. But for the average vet rider, you want to make it a little softer on top so that it's more plush and compliant through the softer chop. But if he makes a big mistake, you want it to get stiff so that he doesn't die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the same thing. Like, so Pro Circuit makes a linkage that flips that curve that makes it uh, softer on top and then it gets stiffer as you go deeper in the stroke. It's more progressive rate linkage. And um, as far as I understand, like the Japanese manufacturers, that's how they come stock. And... Uh, so that that linkage makes it softer on top, more comfortable. But for me to go race a national, I might be better on the stock linkage than the pro circuit one. His is better for an average rider, everyday rider, me at Glen Helen, because I want more comfort rather than hold up. Yeah. So so that's one thing I like on the KTM. The Luxon clamps have been a big help over the years from those at the two stroke national what, lot. What uh, offset do you ride on the new chassis? 23.5? No, 23.5? I just run the standard. You ride stock? Yeah, yeah, standard. Yeah. I believe it's 22. I don't know off the top I of my head. I think it is stock, yeah. I haven't messed with any of that on the KTM. Like I've never had an issue with the front end feel. So I haven't, we've had the op opportunity to try 23.5 like he's mentioned, but yeah. I haven't even tried it. Yeah, I haven't either. I've got 22 extra rigs on mine. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so, so yeah. So those are two things like Lux on that, suspension, um, and then other things to make it more compliant. FCP, engine mounts we're helping. Yeah. Um, and then just breaking in the wheels, breaking in the frame. Like, it's not that bad stock. Like, once you get yep. over, once you get past that 10-hour mark and put some time on it. And even that 10 hour mark, like it's not that bad as long as you know what you're riding and yeah. you're comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd agree. Uh, so then last bike to talk about for the 450s, the Honda. <laughs> Dude, I want to like it, eh? Yeah. I really. Hey, it's the bike that won all the races, so it should be the best. Oh, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that, that, that bike feels like it's so good. Yeah. And then it just turns under itself. Just, and it's every turn it feels like ev everywhere at least for me mm. there was just not i was basically the more i rode it the more i would just anticipate when it was gonna have that l real like oversteery yeah moment yeah and then but I, I just i was didn't even know how you'd fix it i'm like oh, what would you do to this to make it feel different yeah for me it was just sagging it out like lower in the rear end 108 sag dropping the forks flushing the clamps then we did we did throw a twenty three five ride engineering triple clamps on that one, um, and that helped a lot. And then what else did I do? That was pretty much my setup. I raced it at Thunder Valley this year, so I did the Yamaha Hank, Paula gas gas at Hangtown and Honda at Thunder Valley, and yeah, that was basically my setup. The ride engineering we put FMF on there. Um, I don't remember if I put engine mounts from FCP on there or not, but the Honda is like amazing engine amazing amazing ergonomics like it feels yeah, awesome yeah. and you feel like factory and you feel like jet lawrence when you ride it for a little bit and then all of a sudden you make a mistake and you're like where did that even come from right um so that's basically my experience with the honda like it's great great until it's not and yeah. you yeah like you said you have to anticipate the the twitch on the front end the tucking in the front end in the corners and i honestly feel for chase sexton because like I'm like, yeah, I know what he feels like. You feel, yeah. you feel amazing and then you get spit off and you don't know how it happened. And it's totally different, different shock, different suspension, different everything on his bike and stuff. But it's, you, you have to ride it differently. And did you, did you hear when Trey Kennard said that they run about 95 mil sag? I did. Yeah. That was wild. Crazy. Yeah. But I've felt Jet and Hunter's like steering and stuff on their bike too. Like they, it seems like even they do a lot 
yeah to like compensate for that feeling steering stabilizers too i think they would have yeah Yeah. Yeah. Um, i think they had the show one on there yeah and you got a little piece behind the number plate so you can't see it (laughs) oh really yeah just a little just for photos and stuff yeah uh, okay there's nothing really big to high it's just a stabilizer but yeah it definitely helps that bike a lot yeah it's pretty incredible that jet like you're talking about that bike you can't make a mistake dude won 22 races in a row yeah like how do you go and be that perfect on that bike because when i looked at chase's crashes i spoke wygant was on the show before you oh cool and uh i was talking to him and saying like why did nobody blame the bike in the commentary in the booth it was they were so hard on chase Mm. chase chase Chase. i'm like but if you ride one of those bikes the crashes he's having are the crashes that everybody feel like you're going to have on yeah the bike and it's just a it's like a characteristic yeah yeah no honestly uh i think jet rides it perfectly obviously and and i did a video like i like i told you every week i have to do videos so some weeks it's about us testing some weeks it's about us building some weeks we're traveling racing some weeks you're just talking about what happened at the race and that's the fun part of my job too is getting to break it down a little bit and uh so i was talking about jet and on the podium at mm, Redbud last year, he talked about, I'm not as strong as these guys, so I have to ride the bike a little smarter. I have to finesse it a little bit. The 450 is a big bike. It'll bite me really easily if I don't respect the power. So I have to be smart with how I handle it, right? And that was a rough quote of what he said in the press conference. And I talked about it in the video, and I was just like, you know, he's doing everything you have to do to, to manage this to bike make well. that bike he, work. he respects it. Yeah. He's not trying to make the bike work for him. He's trying to like work for the bike almost, you yeah. know, and yeah. then coming from the 250, having great technique, having insane fitness to be able to hold that technique and like all those p- puzzle pieces come together to where, you know, he's respecting that bike and then, um, yeah, riding it exactly where, where it needs to be ridden. It's pretty impressive. And then because like, he's he knows that he can't go charge hard on it like he has to knock it down like i told you about the yamaha Mm. remember when i i just said like about the yamaha when i toned it down i went faster and i think jet's feeling that same thing like hey dude this thing is gnarly like i gotta hold on to this for 30 minutes okay i'm gonna tone it down a little bit and then it just keeps getting better and better you know and yeah it looks like he's not trying and he is trying we know he is yeah but uh but yeah, I think that that tech that mindset of uh, going slower to go faster and being mindful of like I know I can push right here, so doing it, and then like hey, I feel a little uncomfortable here. What do I do to change that? And you know, his his group and him are second to none, and like making those changes on the fly and and being present enough to like I did, that didn't work that lot. Let's try something else, you know. Yeah. So it's pretty impressive and and uh, yeah, w- wild to see. So d- does the 250 Honda have the same characteristics or is it just in the 450? The 250 Honda is a lot slower, a yeah. lot slower. So like the biggest thing uh, I learned as a test rider, like the engine, like the 250 is maybe 10 pounds, uh, it's 10 pounds lighter. Uh, like it's actually 15 pounds lighter, but that's, that's a huge difference, but it's still a 219 pound motorcycle. So it's still heavy. And so... But the 250 engine is a lot, the the rotating mass inside the engine, the piston, everything inside the cylinder. Are, it makes the biggest difference. It's a lot smaller. Yeah. So like I like to picture a spinning top, like yeah. you're a little kid and you spin a top and it just keeps going. If you got a little one and you touch it with your finger, it falls over real like easily and then bounces back up, right? Yeah. Think about if you have like a 10 pound spinning top and you somehow were able to get it fast enough to spin and you touched it, you, you, your hand would be hurting. Like it wouldn't yeah. even budge, yeah. right? Yeah. Like that's the difference between a 450 and a 125. 125 is like a little tiddler, like little spinning top that you could just think and knock over and whip it and lean it into corners and, you know, rail some berms and just like, it, it's not going to upset the chassis because it's slow, but also because rotating mass will let you dive into corners like that. Same thing with the 250, same thing like with the 350. The 350 is only one or two pounds lighter than the 450 KTM, but it feels way lighter on the track because of the rotating mass inside of the engine. So it's like, uh, yeah, learning to respect that makes makes a big difference. I don't even know what your question was. Well, the 250 Honda 450. Oh, so yeah, yeah. The, the so, fact that the, just that rotating mass yeah. 
It because that's why I never liked four fifties. That's why I tell the people it's like I'm on the brakes, but the bike doesn't want to stop. Yeah. So, but all that is is everything rotating to and go. still mo- so the motor's still revving yeah. and still moving forward. And what you might be at twelve thousand RPM, and then when you're in your braking zone, you're in five thousand RPM. But yeah, it's like still, still forward. Oh, that's still five thousand revs per minute. Yeah, that it's pushing you forward. Yeah, and that's the feeling I always didn't like on a 450 and especially like i feel like now i could go pick up a 450 i rode one a bunch in dubai but being fitter and riding a lot more this year i'd yeah. just go get a 450 and i'd be sweet i'd yeah. say i could a lot of my complaints about 450s are gone purely based on being a better rider yeah but that weight and that feeling and that push and you got to think like every time you come into a turn the motor's trying to stand up exactly and push like a forward. like a spinning top. Yeah, yeah. I'd always say like a, a hard drive. You know when you pick up oh, a hard yeah. drive and it's spinning. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of the same thing, and you've got that gyroscopic yeah. effect, and you kind of like get flown around. Totally. But that's basically what's happening inside a motorcycle. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Um, but so so to answer your question, the two fifty is a lot easier to handle because you don't have the speed, the power, the spinning top going inside the engine that's going to pull you out. So like. There's not as many complaints with 250 Honda handling. The one funny story I have with 250 Hondas is thing is whips like no other, dude. Really? Hondas, Hondas in general whip like no other. Like you can, you just think about whipping and it whips off the jump. And I, when I first started MXA, like 2018 Honda 250, I, I was riding KTMs before and then our Huskies when I raced. I got on the Honda and we're at Comp Edge and they're like, yeah, throw a whip, hit this jump, get some pictures, you know? And I'm like completely upside down. And I'm like, whoa, that was crazy. Like, I don't want to get hurt. Like there's only, you guys, I have one photographer here. There's nobody else who cares. Like, just don't whip it so big, you know? Just get a cool photo. Like you whipped it too big to where the photo doesn't even look good because you only look at the underside of the bike. Like <laughs> for the magazine, we want to see the whole bike. So we don't need that big of a whip, you know? Yeah. So like, just chill out. And then like, okay, less of a whip even bigger and it just got bigger and bigger and it's like dude how does this thing like because of like i mentioned that rotating mass how honda positions the weight inside of their chassis it handles and moves quicker and turns sharper because of those things so in turn it whips bigger but if you put me on a ktm sometimes it's harder for me to whip um sometimes it's not just depend on the day but uh but yeah honda 250 up insane for whips honda 450 the same thing and it, it all ties together um, with, like you said, that, that rotating mass. So the Honda 250, not too bad for handling. Like it's it's good, but you're not going fast enough. Like you got to work a lot harder to make your Honda 250 engine as fast as a KTM or even Yamaha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, and oh, what was I going to, I was going to ask something else. About, oh, did you get the Honda to where you actually like it? Mm. or you, you couldn't quite get it there even with all because that's kind of what i left wondering like i wonder if i could get this to work because yeah. how good is a honda 450 it's good like you just want to love a honda dude you feel amazing like i feel like jet lawrence when i ride it or chase sexton and like or ken roxon you know whoever's on it at the time you feel like them you know and uh the engine is amazing and they like that's the other story about honda it's like started out at 60 horsepower engines not too long ago and then the last couple of years, they just keep toning it down, down, down. And it's like the Honda's gotten slower and slower, uh, but it's easier to ride because of that. So it's funny how that works. Um, now I think it's 56 horsepower, 57, but we don't want more horsepower on that bike. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. We, yeah. we want to make it easier to ride. So I did get it feeling pretty good with AHM before I raced it at Thunder Valley, but it was only a handful. Like I didn't get enough time on it and... I definitely wouldn't say that I have that bike dialed. Like it's even even after many days of testing different things on that bike, like we figure out what helps it, what makes it better. But I, I haven't gotten to the point to where it's like, you know, I could feel great on it. And that because of that, it's like we always say like it takes a full time job to make a Honda four fifty good. You know what I mean? You gotta you gotta be willing to test. Even guys who like Honda are like, no, you gotta be real particular particular about your torque settings you got to be very meticulous about this this and that so it takes it's uh it's not a set it and forget it type bike at least not in my experience but yeah. at the same time it's still a honda 450 it's still an amazing bike i don't want to sound like a honda hater but it's it's, it's, it's a challenging just, bike to yeah figure it's out. got its own it's very peculiar for sure for uh sure. so then when you you were at the ktm launch the other night 
did you what did you think of Chase? Oh, I thought he looked pretty good. Um, I yeah, I was impressed. I mean, I try not to read too much. Like, I'm not the best bench racer yeah. when it comes to like <laughs> yeah. off season stuff and like looking too far into it. You know, the guys who are the worst in off season sometimes are the best at in, at A one and so. But as far I, th- I thought it was cool. I think it's going to be cool. I really respected like in the interview that I did with him. Like I tried to get him to talk about Honda versus KTM, and he admitted that like yeah, the Honda wasn't good. You know, there was problems that I had with it, but some of the problems were my fault. Like I should have wrote it differently. I should have maybe approached it a little different way, um, setting up the bike. You know, so he he owned his mistakes, and I was I thought that was cool. I've known Chase since he was like. 13, we went to the Czech Republic and raced the Junior World Championships and he rode the same exact way back then, you know, back flat and butt out and like standing a lot. And it was pretty cool to see that on a little YZ85. And uh, and yeah, so he's still got the same style. He's still ripping. And I was impressed with his interview more than I was with his riding. Like the riding, yeah, riding cool. was cool. Yeah. And like the track was fresh for them. So they built a brand new track. And so all the guys were kind of like, ooh, it's a little steep, it's a little dark out here. They were all kind of taking it easy. And then they have all these people watching them. So, but he, he looked cool. He looked good. Uh, I, I listened to that actually, the interview that you did with him. Oh, cool. And the one thing that is, I thought was, <clears throat> I thought it was cool that he said that I've been saying on the podcast for probably since Unadilla, Unadilla is where I really noticed it. Where I was, I said Chase puts too much load through his foot pegs on braking. Nice. So that's like you can see Jet is they ride the same technique visually. Like mm-hmm. if you looked at it, but Jet is unloading the bike in the roughest sections of the track. Yeah. And Chase is loading the bike yep. through the roughest sections of the track. So I after that that round in particular that's when i was like okay i know what i think i know what's going on totally and then you could see chase has so much load and it it's almost like he loads it to that release point Mm -hmm. it's because i feel like that honda has a release point where it's like it goes and it feels (laughs) great and then it just it releases yeah and so it's like he's loading the bike and flirting with that release point essentially in every time that he is breaking and because it was one of the things where when he did the podcast it's like a puzzle you know i'm like trying to figure it all out yeah and so i was like where do you feel the most pressure on your body when you ride and he says my feet and i was like "Mm, okay so that was like the first little bit and when you know some of the exercise like the workout stuff that he does the feeling and like where you get the most tension in your body and so like it's a little bit of a puzzle piece to put together yeah so i'm like all right i think he's loading the bike too much and then he's on a bike that has this snap oversteer in a certain part of the turn yeah and those two things are coming together and then so to listen to him say in your interview that i just was loading the bike too much i was like oh ooh, he's yeah. been watching everybody else too man no, no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he has <laughs> but I, like he would have felt that's obviously what he's feeling yeah is that because there is that's what i was trying to ride like and i'm still riding like yeah. is that load like really loading the bike a lot yeah um but yeah, it's like when you see Jet, he's doing almost like what mountain bikers do where they're just like clip-ins, Hopping. right? Yeah, just yeah. like unload. Everything's unloading yep. as much as possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just it was very interesting to hear him say that in that video. That is pretty interesting. Um, I'm a, So Panikrev, they do, it's a Christian motocross ministry and they do camps. Yeah. So I'm getting ready for our winter camp. We're going to be training riders, uh, technique and everything. So we do technique, we do chapel service and all of it mixed in together for three days in a row. And so I've been a trainer what there. What track are you guys doing it at? We're doing it at Barona, Barona Oaks down oh, in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. So it's been at Glen Helen for a long time and then it moved to Lake Elsinore for a while. And then now we've trying to mix it up so we're going to try barona for the first time is there still slots available for oh yeah you oh can, sick dude we'd love to get you signed up for it if you want when <laughs> or somebody it? could come it's uh january one two three okay so cool. right the week of a1 every year winter camp is usually the week of a1 and then we do summer camp in the middle of summer in socal and then they do texas washougal summer camps as well so yeah sick but yeah, there's probably a bunch of people that are like listening that would go for sure for sure it'd be awesome to have anybody but 
Um, so yeah, long story short, like from training at those camps, like I become a better rider training kids and training guys. Like we have guys from seven to 57, you know, like vet guys come, uh, a lot of young middle-aged guys um, and younger guys, young adults, and then a lot of minis. It's a wide range of guys. But, you know, talking about the loading, like I think it is right to load your foot pegs. Yeah. Of course. Like you want all of your weight to be going through the foot pegs. That's the center of the bike. But Jet does it in, in an exceptional way of like loading it when it needs to be loaded and, and then unloading, unloading it when it, it needs yeah. to be unloaded. And Chase, like hopefully, the, I'm a huge Chase fan. I'm a huge fan of all of them. But, like hopefully his his technique works on the KTM and he can prosper and do well on it and um, he said that it does take that load better you know put yeah, it through the foot pegs. exactly yeah so that's pretty interesting it'll be cool to see but even like going back to the camps like feet foot on the peg standing laps like that's stuff that I work on with with the guys there and and then on the other flip side of that like me being in this position now analyzing like you are all the guys that are racing interviewing them. Like I got to ask Dungey and Tomac and uh, Jeremy McGrath and all these guys what their favorite technique drill is. Like I'm like, well, what's the best question I could ask? Well, I want to know what Dungey did to get such good technique, you know. And he said he just rode around in circles. He just he he would just get in a parking lot and ride around in a circle and like find like get the proper technique like elbow, head, foot position and just like ride around in circle for a long time. And I think that was Shannon Nide that him and Trey Kennard trained with. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was, and they would do a lot of that. And then Tomac, it was feet on the pegs, um, and McGrath, it was like pushing through jumps. But long story short, like analyzing these guys racing and what they're doing right and wrong like you are, and then training riders at the camp, like telling guys for three days in a row, and I ride too, like, hey, this is what you should do. This is how it should look, and I do it and have fun and like rip the corner. Like all those those three puzzle those two puzzle pieces help me become a better rider now. Yeah. But when you're in the grind of racing, like I didn't watch, I didn't I didn't watch very many videos. I didn't listen, you know, to anybody. Gypsy Tales wasn't around when I was racing, so I had nobody <laughs> to listen to, you know. So I was just like grinding on racing and grind at the gym, grind at the track with Ramsey. And like Ramsey had us working on technique and stuff, but. It was but such a small percentage of it was always just focus. Yeah, just me. And even with Ramsey, like he had it, he changed and helped me night and day. But there's still more that I've continued to learn since then. Um, and it's just funny, like watching videos and dissecting other riders helps so much. Like, as you know, I didn't, I would be on TV, like my buddy would text me, like, dude, there's a shot of you in Supercross, you know, and like they got a clip of you at Unadilla this weekend. I didn't even watch it because I was so busy driving to the next round yeah. or like, you know, flying back home. And it's like, I have one day off. Am I going to go like fast forward for the five seconds I was on TV or am I just going to do something else, you know? And like, I got ruined by Baggett and Tomac this weekend and I don't even want to watch them. Like I just yeah. unplug for the day, you know, and then go back to training the next day. So it's just funny how like, dissecting it helps so much and i think i wish i would have done that more as a rider maybe like dude honestly a biggest benefit for me like let's for me like once a month take a full training day instead of going to the track stay home and watch videos of myself and watch videos of guys i want to be like how much better would i've been if i would have just spent one day a month instead of going to Glen helen or milestone or wherever track i was going to and instead of going to the gym or a road bike ride that day i skipped it did a recovery day and just watched. And like, I don't even have to take away my Sunday recovery day when I go in the church or when I'm hanging out with friends, like just make it a part of my training regimen. Yeah. How much better do you think the average pro would be if he spent more time doing that kind of stuff? Well, dude, think about the NFL. The they're, NFL, all they're doing, watching tape, watching tape. Every player gets filmed specifically. They know the other they, teams, how they're doing. Oh man, they have film study every single week. It's like a huge part of it. And it's hard with moto because you've got to get someone to be out there to film but jiu-jitsu it's not dude, as hard anymore with iphone so. yeah not anymore <laughs> yeah dude jiu-jitsu i film myself all the time really and it is the biggest improvements that i make yeah like because you can that's so it's so different because it's like okay he did this i did this wrong should have done this yeah and then you go forward a sec okay that led to that led to that led to that yeah but even it's the same in moto where you're like you want to stand in a certain way. You want to have like it, dude. The technique. The crazy thing is jujitsu technique and moto technique basically the same. Yeah. Have your toes in a little bit. 
Well, go so. No, that's like that's the technique for everything, kind of though. Like the like the athlete technique is a little bit toes in, like lead with your legs, like your hips control your, your yep. momentum on the bike. Like my wife riding horses, like she's she jumps horses and this and that and like same stuff, toes in. Yeah, yeah well yeah. they actually do toes out, but 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 uh. So that I guess contradicts what I'm saying, but they're over the over the bike, over the horse. You know, yeah. they have no handlebars, so they're having to hold on differently. And so I would do lots of comparisons. And there's so many things like looking through the jump rather than out the jump, yep. like that they do in riding horses. So I totally believe you. Like same thing with football. Like you know, your your hips, your shoulders. Like you got to work on all of it. So yeah, but yeah, like the position is the the same position that Chase would explain. Like yeah. I need to get my toes in because if your toes are out it's so easy to like for someone to pull you forward for sure if your toes are in a bit then like it's so much harder for your weight to yeah. get pulled forward yeah and then you're like pushing back through your hips ass back like low center of gravity yeah. same as a dirt bike like because if you're in jiu-jitsu standing up the person wants to like basically flip you so that they're on top and you're on on the ground yeah but it's like so you low back hips like it's the same position you know Dude. but yeah the watching tape and the couple weeks before Glen Helen I said to Anna I was like all right and she's like how can I help with the vet stuff and I was like I just need you to film me right that's cool like I just have to be able to go home and watch myself because you can make so many improvements just by watching that's cool and comparing yeah yeah honestly uh I was wrong about my wife and the horses they don't do toe us out they do uh ankles low yeah and they go which is same for super low same for dirt bikes yeah yeah And I think the toes do kind of come out. I've only I've ridden horses a couple of times with her, but well, uh, it just might that might not let you put them in. Like, yeah, it's a little different. Yeah, yeah, with the stirrups and stuff. But uh, but yeah, on the same token with um, with filming, it's I don't I'm kind of lost where I'm going now. Just when watching yourself ride. Yeah, watching yourself ride makes a makes a huge difference. Um, oh, I guess with my job now everything i do is on video on camera yeah. dude if i mess up it's on camera right and uh trevor nelson our guy he follows and covers everything and like every time i race you know it's part of a story it's part of a video it's part like i want to go race a works off-road race or wake, race something cool well that means that we got to do a video of it you know and then we got to do an article of it to make sure it's worth it's worthwhile it. yeah. exactly so we can get it paid for basically and um so all my mistakes are on camera and all my highs and lows are on camera i'm like man my elbows are this or that you know and but how much better like i feel so much smarter as a rider now because of that um rather than before where it's just grind 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 you know and you're so grind you're in the grind so much that you don't want to step outside of the box and yeah take one step back to go two steps forward almost for sure, for sure. well we just did three and a half hours mate I know you've got to get to pro circuit yeah and, uh, and get one of your bikes i'm so glad we did it thank it you was, for having uh, me awesome chat i'm sure people will learn a lot i appreciate and, it and uh, we'll do it again sometime dude thank you so much it's an honor to be on here an honor to uh hang with you and yeah thanks for watching there thanks for hanging we'll uh ride tuesday let's look forward to it see you at the track <laughs> sweet as We are excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com, packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.